Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us this morning as we deliberate on college business. Open our minds, open our hearts so that we are doing your will and doing it in the right way. We ask you to bless our findings this morning and be with it each, each with, be with each of us this morning as we go forth. We do ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning and welcome. We appreciate all of your presence here this morning. Before we start through the agenda, I want to take this opportunity to welcome our new president, Dr. Bill Law, here this morning. We're very, very pleased that you're here with us and looking forward to uh, a new chapter in this institution's history. And before we get started, I just wanted to give you an opportunity for maybe some uh, opening comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. My, my sidekick, Tom Furlong, disappeared and, and the comments of the president got excised from the board agenda so I, I wanted to be sure of my sense of place here. Um, uh, Tom is under the weather. He's been, as this is not going to be a surprise to everybody, spectacularly helpful to me, uh, certainly in, in the short time I've been here, but you, you know that we have been working closely together since since I was named. So uh, Tom's fine, just some, some kind of flu and uh, we expect to see him back, so thank you very much. I uh, can only tell you I thought I was excited the day I was named, and then I thought I was excited as I drove up to TARP in the first morning. Uh, it has just crescendo. The, the ability to uh, start to understand all of the, the wonderful things and, and certainly to meet all of the wonderful people, um, I am feeling very, very uh, enthusiastic, uh, and we have already started on, on a number of really good things. So. All of you, thanks very much. The, uh, the, the staff, the campus people were wonderful. Uh, they uh, certainly took uh, time to show me. I asked them to just tell me, uh, they were, we're, I'm gonna be a regular visitor, but you know, the first meeting, tell me, take me to the spot you want me to see. Let's talk about things that are important to you. And, and we talked about their programs and their services and what happens next. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, I think if you'll just give me a little bit of time to continue my exploration about what's working and, and what might need some attention, we'll do fine. But we are off to a great start after the first week, thanks to the generosity and spirit of, of all involved here. Beautiful. Well, we're thrilled you're here. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have some retirement resolutions. Now, I need a little bit of coaching. Doesn't the supervisor generally attend with? So for John H. White, John W. White, excuse me. John, come on up. Is that your whole family there? Well, Come on, if there's a baby, bring that baby up here, okay. Wow. Oh my God. Good grief. Oh, this is good. <laughs> is everyone going to speak? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm going to get there early for Thanksgiving. You know that? <laughs> it is so good. To, this is really encouraging. This is great. John, congratulations. John W. White began his career at St. Petersburg College in 1991 as the college's engineer for major construction projects college-wide and as an adjunct instructor in mathematics at the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus. John's major focus as the college engineer has been at the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus and at the Seminole campus, although he has worked throughout the district. John's education consists of SPJC, a bachelor in science degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Florida, and a master's degree <laughs> in business and engineering, <laughs> I'm sorry, John, from the University of South Florida. Here's the big paragraph, okay? John has been married to his bride, Candy, for 44 years.
four natural children, four adopted children in the process of adopting a fifth, 12 grandchildren and counting. They have been foster parents for 40 years, with 30 of those years being children of special medical needs. They have fostered more than 300 children during this duration. John has a loving and caring spirit. We wish him happiness in his retirement as he travels, spends time with his family and loved ones, and goes to his beloved Rays games. Now, therefore, be resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college and the community by John W. White and extend to him our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. John, congratulations. What an honor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stand next to that baby. I'm not sure that I can add much to uh, that resolution um, without tearing up. Um, uh, we've, we've, we have lived with John and this family right here, I can tell you, for multiple years and have um, have celebrated with him as his family has grown and as he and uh, his family has had families and um, so it's just an honor to be uh, associated with John and to be a friend of John and to have him as part of our family. One of the things uh, about John if you've ever seen him on the job site is you know that John takes particular um, interest in making sure that the contractor does exactly what he's supposed to do so that we get our money's worth. And if it's on those construction documents, that contractor better have that done exactly the way it's there or John is going to let him know. So he's been a wonderful, wonderful asset to the college. We will miss him terribly and uh, we hope that we continue to see John and his family at all of our events and we will miss you all. And Candy is bride also. <laughs> Um, I just want to say that I really enjoy working at the college. It's kind of a, an extended family. And you can see I have a large family to start with. There's only part of them here. And uh, it's been a, a real good ride. I'm looking forward to being able to still do adjunct math teaching upon occasion. And uh, who knows? So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for bringing your whole family, or most of them, anyway. <laughs> and Brown. And if you'd like to borrow some family, John will lend you. <laughs> 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 Ann Brown began her career as a senior purchasing specialist at the old district offices. I would say, well, see, now they're getting personal, aren't they? <laughs> okay. Of the old district offices of St. Petersburg College. And Ann's first assignment at district offices was entering rollover purchase orders for year end. <laughs> Four years later, she moved with purchasing to the Epicenter Services Building. She soon became known as the technology specialist for her colleagues. Her favorite four-letter word soon became Dell. <laughs> Anne is known to her colleagues as a dedicated buyer who is always willing to give her best to the college. If a dollar can be saved, she will find it. Anne is organized and polished purchasing professional who is highly respected by all for her knowledge and expertise. Anne has a warm and generous spirit and we wish her happiness in her retirement as she spends time with her loved ones and expands her photography skills. Now, therefore, be it resolved that St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college and to the community by Ann Brown 
and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne has been at the college for nine years and I've had the pleasure of knowing and working her with her for the last three and um, her smiling face, um, her ability to get the task done, um, to always go out there and beat up the vendor community to get the right price <laughs> has been exemplary. Um, she's just a pleasure to deal with. We're going to miss her greatly and her skills and um, I've really enjoyed working with Anne. So tough shoes for us to fill, but we wish you all the best in your retirement. You deserve it. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Anne. Teddy Voitas. <laughs> as you see, Teddy and I go backwards. In fact, Teddy, I, I have to say, as I was looking at the list, I was surprised quite frankly, that you were still employed. I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought your full-time job was chasing me down for backup receipts when, when I was here earlier, okay? You certainly do a great deal of work on my behalf. So it was very good to see your name and, and of course, a chance to uh, refresh our friendship just as you, as you exit. Teddy Voitas, Financial Assistance Counselor for, of, of State Programs. Um, after com will retire on July 31st after completing 30 years of outstanding service. Teddy began her STEAM career at St. Pete's College as an accounts clerk payable. I told you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> after four years, Teddy became purchasing buyer. After two years, she became the business office supervisor, now ending her career in the Electronic Center of Financial Assistance Services as a counselor. Teddy received her Bachelor in Applied Science degree in Behavioral Science in 1997 at National Lewis University, Associate in Science in 1986, and her Associate in Technology Business Administration in 1988 at St. Petersburg College. Teddy's genuine concern for the well-being of the college students and employees reflects her tremendous respect for her different positions held at the college, and Teddy has earned the friendship, admiration, and respect of her students and colleagues at the college due to her dedication, enthusiasm, professionalism, sense of humor, and hard work. Teddy's colleagues take great pleasure in recognizing her significant personal achievements and express heartfelt appreciation for the invaluable services she has rendered to St. Petersburg College. We wish her happiness in her retirement as she travels and spends time with her family and loved ones. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college and to the community by Teddy Voitas and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. Congratulations. Okay. Really nice. Thank you. Thank you. We hold this. Who's the supervisor? Who's you? Okay. Teddy's been a remarkable employee, and she's made us laugh. She's made us cry. <laughs> we love her very much, and we're going to miss her a great deal and wish her nothing but the best. I think uh, the people here can comment on the professionalism that Teddy has exhibited and all the help that she's been to students over the year. But let me just add that she is also a generous and gracious hostess, <laughs> and she's pretty good at karaoke. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I've loved all my years here. As you can see, I have a bigger family than John does. So I love them all and will miss all of you terribly. Thank you.
I'm getting it right off. It was so hot. Mr. Chair, I move we uh, accept the resolutions and wish our retirees well. Second. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge Paula Ament and Lanice Bryant, who are retiring but could not be with us this morning. Any other discussion on the resolution or on the uh, motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Dr. Law, any new employees that you need to introduce this morning? Um, uh, no, sir. <laughs> I'm okay. like I can remember the names of the okay. people in my office. Okay. Uh, uh, I did. Uh, no, sir. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Ryder. We, we would like to present this to the board. Mr. Brett. Um, this is Jason Green. Jason is the College Sustainability Coordinator. And this is uh, Jim Conley, who's the Director of Corporate Training. Um, this is the U.S. Green Building Council's Florida Gulf Coast Chapter Award, uh, naming uh, St. Petersburg College as the Outstanding Business of the Year. This is an interesting award because it doesn't go to one department in particular, but it goes to many, many departments and it's for many people throughout the entire college community that has contributed to the sustainability efforts that helped us win this award. There's academic programs involved in, uh, in this award. There are student clubs and student initiatives. There are those of you who put your uh, recycled items, those bottles in that uh, blue container over there. We have uh, LEED Gold Sustainability uh, Building. So it's a full college-wide initiative. And uh, Jason Green took the, the lead and went ahead and applied for this award. We didn't think that we were going to really qualify this award because we're not really per se a business, or, or maybe we are. But I think because of the outstanding initiatives and the fact that it involves the entire college community, that we really were one of the front runners for this award. Um, so we would like to present this award to the board, uh, Mr. Brett. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just shameless self-promotion. Um, some of the things that corporate training has been involved in is we've created 84 additional courses. All of those are online and they're taught uh, and delivered in a face-to-face -face and blended format. We participated and presented at three different conferences this year. That is with the USGBC, the Florida Green Building Coalition, and ACC. Our community involvement has been with uh, the RAISE and the USGBC. Hope for Haiti and building, uh, rebuilding in a green way. And um, tonight, if anybody has the opportunity, we're participating in the Gulf Oil Spill Forum that's at our own Palladium. That starts at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Connolly, Dr. Connolly, yes, before sir. you get totally away, um, I understand corporate training was doing some other good things on campus, and maybe you can highlight those just for a second for us. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Um, I think the initiative you're talking about is our self-paced uh, learning initiative that you may have heard about. I've worked with Dr. Cooper, um, Dean Sutherland, and Dr. Vitito to create a scenario by which our active duty military can receive training and then have that through experiential learning converted into um, academic credit up to 12 hours for the deployed military. The deployed military, and there's about a million, mo million of them at any one time, don't have access to the internet all the time. And so when they're deployed through the self-paced initiative, they can work at their own pace, come back, uh, when, they, when they do get back, go into a proctored situation and take our own curriculum. Our own curriculum is, of course, SACS approved. We met all the board rules in doing that. So it sounds like a, a good opportunity for St. Petersburg College, and it's an excellent opportunity for our active duty military. What will it do financially for our institution? Um, 
Uh, the company that we're working with was working with uh, University of Valparaiso out of Indiana, and they put 900 students through that program over the last 18 months. So we're hoping that we can ramp up to that. And so over the next, um, in the business plan, and over over the next year as we ramp up, it'll be about $216,000 uh, to the uh, to corporate training. But as that ramps up, that can grow uh, ex exponentially. Wow with other programs. And this would be ongoing then? Yes, sir. So this, uh, Doug, you have a lot more money to spend now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for putting me on the spot again. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Golly. I want to acknowledge that great accomplishment. I, when I first joined the board, um, during my orientation, Ms. Ryder gave me an overview of all of the green initiatives that have been going on at all of the campuses. And uh, this is just a great testimony to all of that hard work. And kudos to your whole team and, and what you've accomplished. It's outstanding. Thank you. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of May 18th. Yes, so move. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, I had, uh, since I wasn't here, I spent a little time reading through these. And uh, I just had a couple comments that I'd, I'd like to, I think uh, Mr. Burke had made some outstanding comments that I want to see us follow up on. Um, the student support expense allocation of, uh, out of the auxiliary funds, uh, the $20 voucher for students versus books. Um, and then we're going to talk later about uh, the museum support that we have. Um, and I think uh, I want to compliment Mr. Burke for his, his comments there because I think they're, they're wor very worthwhile in, the, in our, our budget presentation. And I'd, I'd like to see us do something in the future. I know where this came from, but uh, we keep referring to the operating budget as a picture frame. And, and Con Philippe, I think you're the culprit of this, but it's but it's the uh, um, not a true accounting comment, um, and it doesn't fit into since we're an academic institution, it really doesn't fit into GAP at all. Um, those of us who who have to work with GAP, so so in the future, if we could refrain from picture frame, Ken, you're smiling because you're a CPA too. Um, I just like don't want to see us being on record with non-accounting terms that might come back someday to haunt us. Some student looked at this and said, "You're trying to teach us GAP, and, and you're using strange language that I don't understand." And now that we've got a whole new administration, I think maybe it's the time that, although it's a very descriptive term, um, but it, it doesn't fit into the counting concept. But uh, maybe in the future we can change that. Okay. Any other comments? No. No. <clears throat> Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Mr. Lang. Yes, sir. Uh, they've taken my first comments away. I wanted to commend the board on doing away with some of the gap terms. That it <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't resist that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pleased to report, gentlemen, that on June 1st, the President's contract was caused to be signed by both the College and the President. He is now locked in as our President, and uh, everything went very smoothly. I want to commend publicly the assistance that was rendered first by our College Attorney, Mr. McKenzie, by uh, Dr. Law's Attorney, Randy Hanna and by Tracy Jantz, who did work for the board. And I think with the assistance of, of everybody involved, it was a very professional uh, activity. Can we get copies of the signed contract? Yes. They're, the signed ones are with, uh, with uh, Sid, and he'll get you those. The changes were made. We deleted the requirement for a physical that was there, and uh, we tied the terminable pay to our rules so that uh, I think everything's done that the board requested to be Excellent. done. Excellent. Thank you. Great. 
Any questions <coughs> of Mr. Lang? Thank you, sir. <coughs> Mr. McKenzie, anything from you? No, sir. Okay, moving on to agenda item number nine. Terry, if it's fine with you, I'll go ahead and make a motion, although I have several discussion items, probably other board members do also, to approve Roman numeral 9A, B, C, D, E, and F. Second. We have a first and a second discussion. Go ahead, Mr. Burke. Um, first of all, I, I, I posed some questions to Dr. Law um, concerning the um, consulting internal auditing services and since we're discussing accounting terms it's always been um, interesting to me that we call what Gregory Sher Quinn does internal auditing because it's really not internal auditing it's an external <laughs> firm um, and really when there's items that are of a internal audit nature or even though it's being done by the external um, uh, firm the board should be sent those audits independently, um, just like the Auditor General does. When, the, uh, when we are audited by the Auditor General, although we receive a copy from Kim, there's always a copy sent to us directly from the Auditor General, and that's proper accounting procedure that you report, the Auditor General reports directly to the board um, that they're auditing um, the entity of the entity, the governing board. So I, I just want to, in the future, if, uh, if Gregory Sher Quinn is going to be doing, or Stuart, old name, um, uh, the uh, the board should be copied on those on those audits directly from from the accounting firm. Um, and I did ask uh, just uh, how much we were spending on on last year or this current year, and I think the figure is going to be around twenty some thousand. And there's an outstanding bill, so there's not this is not a significant amount of accounting services. Um, being done so I just want to make those comments and put those into the record the, the other item and and I apologize and I see the answer is confusing because I referenced the wrong item on the board agenda with my questions um, about the three hundred thousand dollars that would and and I referenced the item beforehand which was fifteen thousand right. that's why there's confusion here on the on the answers because they're saying this only costs fifteen thousand we're not doing any of this monitoring that you're asking us because it's middle school kids right, right, right. Um, but the next one which is where, where my questions were all directed towards the crop program because it looks like on the crop program and it looks like the college receives a grant for a hundred fifty thousand five hundred forty eight and then we match it with a grant of a hundred and fifty thousand um, five forty eight if I'm reading this right and it doesn't ever tell us how many kids are involved with this program what's the cost per student involved um, involved is it are there hundreds of kids thousands of kids tens of kids involved with this program that we're spending 300,000 and then how do we measure success on this program because this is supposed to from what I'm reading this is to help them stay engaged in their education so is there any tracking since it's grade 6 through 12 is there tracking that in this program I know has been in effect for several years is at least last year I think prior to that too is there any tracking to these kids as a result of this program does it help them do they graduate at higher high school graduation rates than than people who don't go through the crop program and how many of them is there any tracking as to how many of them apply for college admission after their high school is it higher than kids who don't go through crop um, but this is a lot of money and it's if it's a good program I'm for not only putting this resources I for putting more resources into it dr. Um, white would you so like to come forward and address some of these concerns please thank you Good morning Good morning we had 345 in the program last year we have 340 this year and counting in just the last few months we hired a new director of crop Lucretia Wright and she has brought new energy and infusing much more into the program than what we had for months prior to her and so I'm expecting that that 345 number from last year will be well exceeded in the time to come 
we have crop reports that do come out each year. I don't have those with me today. We do have a certain amount of tracking that goes on. And the, many of those students also come through Summer of Success and then do come into the college. I can get those numbers That's for you. Nice. But from what your knowledge is, ha has, is there a significant difference between their high school graduation rate and what the, the graduation rate for what's considered um, disadvantaged children? I believe that's what you'll find from the reports. And I'm sorry, I don't have those okay. this morning. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, there is a, and, and, and Mr. Burke, there's a pretty extensive annual report that's submitted with the grant. Let's pull those and, and these, these have been, I don't know about the current context, but they, they traditionally have been pretty effective programs. So let's see what our report looks like and what it's been. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. is actually part of a fund 10 salary that we pay to Linda Hogan's the director um, I understand that's unusual for a grant the Department of Education allows us to count that as part of the match I don't think that usually happens in grants and then the other 44,805 is in kind so our total match is actually 120,079 and that's the breakdown I think Tanja can also speak to the tracking a little more if you would like to Mr. Chairman, I, that's fine. I'd like the opportunity to kind of review it and bring it back in a structured way. That's okay, fine. So that's fine. Mr. But Gibbons, they, they may have questions. Would you also, Dr. Law, um, I thank you, Mr. Burke, for those questions because I really uh, on target with you. I think. Um, would you also bring us back the um, how the program set up? There's a director, assistant director, manager, whatever, so we can also see if we are if we have the numbers are we spending too much in overhead I think that's important mr. chairman with your okay I'll reschedule this for old business and bring it back next month with a, a structure that you can have in your hand so. fine thank Ms. you Burks, mr. Johnson I'd like to follow up on uh, mr. Burke's comments about item uh, 9b um, at one time chairman of the board and I was functioning as this internal audit position he instructed me that as the chairman that the internal uh, the, the external auditors worked for the board and the reports were to go directly to the chairman and the chairman then would distribute them <laughs> rather than going back through the college and I think Joe you'll probably remember that uh, it's totally proper and I think it's a good comment that you brought up they are our employee employees we employ them as the board <coughs> and their reports should come directly probably to the chairman uh, at one time that was a process that we had and it's fallen by the wayside since then so it's a very good comment that you brought up on that I idea okay. mr. Burke on the um, crop program, are we approving that though today because we need to with the, to get to the grant, right, and we'll just get the information. I just want to make sure it's we're approving program. it. I'm okay. fine with that. Okay. The other question, it's really not a question, it's a comment. I just want to compliment and I appreciate the answer you gave me. I thought it was um, very engaging of the college on this uh, rotary um, grant that we received on the prosthetics and that showed a, a lot of um, initiative on the college's part and maybe you can speak real quickly on the uh, origin I, of that because I thought it was um, I th it was just interesting and um, I think it's an opportunity obviously some sharp employee here at the college really um, grabbed that and uh, <laughs> made that happen so I appreciate that some sharp employee whose name is Denise Kerwin <laughs> she is with us today Mr. Chairman with your indulgence just Please. two minutes from from Denise if you would I may look like the sharp employee, but <laughs> this was made possible by a lot of people at this college. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity that came to us by a Google search. Um, since the inception of the O&P program at the college, um, we have been providing continuous new programs for the orthotics and prosthetics 
employees and professionals. And when they did a Google search, they found some of those continuing education programs. They contacted our O&P program, who then sent them the information. Dr. Nicotera and Dr. Vitato jumped right on it with us, and we made it happen over about a six-week period. It will be a four-week training that we will have two physicians and two benchmen from the Basra Clinic in Iraq. This came about by a Rotary International program. They developed it uh, several years ago through the Rotary of Iraq. When the Iraq went to war, then that Rotary is no longer, so Rotary of Jordan is the closest one. And they did some limited training at Rotary of Jordan several years ago. We're not <coughs> able to utilize all the funds and, and uh, the programs. They did send over new and used prosthetics to the Basra Clinic. And what we'll be doing is bringing these folks over and allowing them um, to have the training to hopefully attend a state or national convention while they're here so that they can meet the um, experts from, from all over as well as some of the vendors and then to give them a, additional information and specialize their training so that what we teach them then they can utilize when they go home to their country. Um, the situation is desperate there. People come from all over the country. They are using 20-year-old prosthetics. They are using some wood, wooden prosthetics, we understand. And they want to do a better job for their patients. So this will give us the opportunity to provide this wonderful training, I think open up some other State Department initiatives. We were supposed to start in July, but uh, they're going to hold up the travel documents now to give us more time for planning as well, since it's taken so long to get through the process and they should be arriving in September. So hopefully you'll have the opportunity to hear about them and maybe meet them at that time. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Mr. Burke. And Dr. Law, um, I'm going to make a suggestion, and this sure. puts more work on our Institutional Advancement Office, but um, I think the Chronicle of Higher Education may be interested I in this story right. and our local newspaper. Um, this is really a fascinating story. <laughs> it really is. It is. We will follow up on that. This Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Uh, the motion went all the way through, uh, through through F. Through F. I had a question on the D three. Um, I assume since we're providing space for an outside organization, that we in turn end up <coughs> getting some benefit out of this because we're using college space for uh, in granting a change in this lease. I can shed some light on that. Okay. Good sir. morning to everybody. Good morning. Um, we do get some use out of that. Number one is uh, NUHS provides nine cadavers and we're <laughs> able <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're able to, to use those cadavers to provide a series of workshops <coughs> for our students on an annual basis. So starting in the fall, we will run about 15 workshops for any student enrolled in a biological science. Secondly, um, our O&P students get to go in there and use those cadavers as well as other students at the health center. So we, we in essence, are getting uh, an intangible benefit out of yes. all this. So it helps yes. our education. Yes, process. yeah, it's a sharing there of the cadavers. Okay. They're providing the cadavers. We provide the space and we get some use out of it. Yeah, I just didn't want us to be in the real estate business unless we had some benefit right. out of it. Thank you very okay. much. You're I appreciate welcome. that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Any other discussion on the motion? Uh, I had one on the master plan um, on D4. I think this is an excellent idea. Um, we have run in the past, I think, more on um, as opportunities we arose, we moved on them rather than having a long-term plan on what we wanted really to do and then just take advantage of the opportunities as they jumped out. Um, and I think, I, at least I have heard that most of our campuses, when they are done with their current construction are pretty much going to be built out except for the downtown campus. So I, I would uh, highly recommend that, that uh, we look at and start a master plan of our facilities as proposed here. I think this is a very good idea. Excellent. Great. 
Mr. Gibbons. During the master planning process, I'd also like us to take a look. There's a couple of pieces of, and I've talked to Ms. Ryder and Dr. Law about this. There's a couple of pieces of property that would allow us to also expand our Midtown site. Um, so during that master planning process, I'd, we may have to move a little more quickly, but I'd like for us to also look at how we could um, uh, expand that site as well. Well, that's now under the downtown uh, campus, so I would, that's what I meant when we were talking about the downtown campus, because Midtown <coughs> is now part of that. It's if, just if where we, do we it, want to take that. that. That's true, but if we do this right, we may have a campus in Midtown that wouldn't have to be under. Well, that's, that's true. That, that could well be true. We could, uh, um, is, I, I'm with you 100%, because if, if we have the student base there, then we need to provide the access. And it's my understanding we're out of space. Is that not right, That's Susan? Correct. correct. And, we're and two classrooms to the hall. Well, then that's we're that's right on. We're hustling. Okay, Mr. Burke. Uh, just two items, um, and the Dr. Law. I appreciate the answers to this, but I would appreciate in the future maybe our any of construction board memos if they do include the funding source whether okay. it's coming from pico or wherever just so we understand where it's coming from since we've had that budget explanation and all the different funds it's just helpful to us um knowing and that will avoid the question being Mr. asked Park, maybe maybe we could could share with the board the question was just a clarification of the the revenue sources associated with this and we were able to document that there was uh, if i recall 8.7 million from uh, the bond funds, the 2.75 from the PICO, uh, the sale of the gym, and uh, some CO and DS money, about a million dollars. It's not pledged at this second, but there is a sufficient corpus of revenue for that project to move forward, and we're going to move forward. We'll, we'll refine the which sources are used for this project probably within the next 30 to 60 days, sir. And I just want to say thank you, too, on the personnel report on the salary schedule that we've included pay raises for the um, adjunct faculty that they're receiving the same 4.5% increase, which is important. We didn't discuss that at our last board meeting, but um, right. I'm glad that's part of the, uh, the, the board packet recommendation. Yeah, I would just like to make a statement that uh, under F1 personnel reports, um, I would normally have a conflict of interest since my wife's name is, is listed in here, but on advice of counsel, he's indicated that since it's a termination of a temporary funding source tied in with the Guatemalan people who were here, that I don't have a conflict of interest. So okay. Thank you. I just no, wanted to be on the record. Him. Well, there is in that he'll have his wife for more time. But <laughs> 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 Very smooth <laughs> sit. Uh, I'm going to show her that in the minutes when we will. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, item G, no changes to the rules manual for the board and on to H. Move approval of H and I, Mr. Chair. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Down under agenda item 10. Uh, before we get into the presentations, uh, Dr. Law, I know there are a number of items that, uh, that you would like to, to speak to, if you would, please. Yes, sir. Um, uh, just very briefly, I, uh, we will dress this up for a regular item, but enrollment is robust, hardly describes the, uh, the upward trend here. Uh, the, the, the best indicator is that summer enrollment uh, for the uh, lower division appears to be about a 15 percent increase and about a 20 percent increase at the baccalaureate level. So that's, those are extraordinary numbers. Um, let me say that the fall enrollment is going gangbusters. Uh, we're not quite aligned to where we are in the cycle. So it looks disproportionately high, but we're disproportionately early in some cases. But uh, we are already 40% uh, of, of what the final enrollment will be, and, and we're at mid-June. So I expect that what we're seeing will be 
much, much more in Roman than we did. That leads to another, and, and uh, what I'd like to do is bring these to you on a, on a regular basis, have you see what we're seeing on, on enrollment, get a sense of how much, how fast, where it is, what's working, what's not working. So we'll do that for you. I, I want to give you my assurance that um, uh, this, this one, the, the financial aid people, Michael and, uh, Bennett and those folks are doing a spectacular job. They are way ahead of last year. Can, uh, I, I had the number in my head and now I can't remember. My, my, may I, Mr. Chairman, Mr. just Bennett, ask for a, please. an overview just for a second? It's really yeah. impressive. <laughs> we want to hear this good information. This is real stuff. We were up 41% uh, for the summer, an additional $2.5 million in Pell Grants. We've already uh, processed 15,000 students for the fall. So as Dr. Law mentioned, uh, our total award amount for this current year we're in is $117 million with 20,000 students awarded. Wow. So our numbers continue to go through the roof in the current year and for the upcoming year. Wow. Outstanding. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Thank you. Th those are both extraordinary accomplishments yeah. and getting students served now so that we have more energy and time when the people whose names we don't know show up in August. Th this, is, this is very nice work. We'll continue to focus on financial aid. As you know, there's a number of changes at the federal level. You go first, I'll take the other side. There are benefits to, to what we're doing. There are some real exposures to the institution as to what we have been Penalties. mandated to do. So I, we need to get everybody aware that, in short, we clearly we are the lender now. And we are responsible then for the, the ups and downs of, of the lending business. So paying attention to the details as you serve. We'll, we'll have some work to do with you on exactly what that means, but if you'll give me a chance. I'll I can help you with the lending part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the collections part. <laughs> <laughs> we need to help. Um, <laughs> where is the biggest increase? What campuses have the biggest increase? Do on you know that? Moment? Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> let me look here. This is summer term. Um, you know, here's the electronic campus is 13%, Clearwater is 13%, Seminole is 21%, Downtown Center is 65%, and 58% at Midtown. Did you already know these numbers? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> but I, I asked that question yeah. because when we were talking about master planning, I, yeah. I, I feel bad because I left this out. Dr. Vitito, I'm sorry, but we also need to make sure that we take care of the Clearwater campus in, in that process because of their growth, number one, and number two, I, I've been on their campus and they're limited, and we gotta figure out how to get all those portables off of there. And, and Mr. Chairman, that was just a couple of quick, these are just sort of early advisories. Um, we are working exactly in that area. Some property that this board had considered previously and, and did not execute a purchase on came back on the market at a significantly lower amount. We had already done a lot of due diligence, so we're pursuing that. I suspect we can make that work. It is the church property immediately adjacent to the campus. After I walked that campus last Monday, I, I, if property comes open adjacent to it, we should buy it. I, it just, it's a good idea that when it's gone, it's gone, and, and we need to own it if we can. So we'll, we'll keep you informed, but I did give the go-ahead to pursue that. And then the same thing at Midtown. There are some properties there that say, we're executing. Yeah, I was going to say, Dr. Law, it seems like that. That, that having an urban campus in downtown and in Midtown seems to be working out, and it's the non-traditional student that we've been after. And any way that we can continue to make sure Dr. Omer is successful in, in recruiting that non-traditional student, someone who typically would not be coming into the college system. We need to continue to figure out how to be successful along with CROP. If the CROP is one of those programs and they're marketing and they're bringing, in young, bringing young people and introducing them to our campuses, then we should support those programs. But uh, I think we got to really, um, young people learn differently. And I had the, uh, the um, the privilege of uh, sitting with Dr. Eric Michael Dyson, who is the foremost person on uh, hip hop rap. He teaches at Yale and Harvard and all these other places over the weekend. I sat with him, and the thing that he talked about is that young people can learn, but we have to engage them differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really like to see this college start to engage young people mm -hmm. differently. White, black, Hispanic, doesn't matter. We're gonna have to engage. They're different. When I was a kid, we were outside playing sports. Mm -hmm. These kids are inside, they're techs, 
They, lo- they like all this technology stuff. We got to really have to figure out how to engage the student in a different manner. So, we we are in fact though taking some early moves to acquire some more uh, space opportunities at, at Midtown, and and we'll get that done. Yes. Okay. That seems to be where our major growth is coming from, yeah. is the, the, the midtown, downtown areas. Yeah. And, and Yvonne obviously is doing a fantastic job because she must have a big for rent sign out there and drags everybody in or something. I don't know. But uh, we need to recognize that, Devon, you're right on. Uh, that uh, If that's where it's needed, then we need to figure out how to, how to give access. We, um, and, let, as, and Ms. Brent, I think as, as we head to one of the items is the, the workshop presentations. You've got a, a schedule for the next couple of months, but I, I think as early as September, October, we ought to try to get a focus on campus master planning. And we'll probably do it two or three times in the next year. It just sure. doesn't lend itself to one 20 minute presentation. Great. Anything else, Dr. Long? No, sir. You? Thank you. Terry, before Mr. the presentation, I, I have, because it's easier to do business before these presentations. Um, f- first of all, I want to uh, compliment Martha Campbell for her comments that appeared in the uh, St. Petersburg Times a week ago in the editorial section. Um, that was a very extensive article. Um, who's the fellow who writes, who wrote the column? Um, Maxwell. 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 Uh, Bill, thank you. Um, but it was a, a good reflection on the college with uh, Martha's comments. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of ties to what we're talking about, um, what you're talking about, Devron, and um, student success and remediation was the whole theme of the article. And uh, um, I think this ties with our conversation here Sorry. today. Um, and uh, the other item um, I would like to bring up, and this is always awkward because we have to do our business in front of everyone because that's the way a board is. Um, and that's uh, next, uh, next month is uh, the time we do board elections and um, I tried to think about this as to uh, where you know what we should do on this because this is our decision board members and um, as I made abundantly clear during the presidential search um, and uh, we have two board members whose terms are in limbo right now um, because they're they're past their their normal term time and because of the unusual political situation that we have in our state right now, who knows what's going to happen on those. Probably I would assume that the governor would take no action and let the whoever gets elected, um, because it's almost unfair to those people to appoint anyone different or reappoint them because you may, um, whoever gets elected, you would not be that person's person. (laughs) So, um, and so we have two board members who don't know in limbo. You have Evelyn and I, whose terms expire next May, and um, with a new governor, they may be more um, ambitious, whoever they are, about making appointments right away, which would, which would mean, you know, whether, so we're vulnerable there, um, whether we wish to be reappointed is another question. Um, and so, Terry, <laughs> you're the only person whose terms are uh, effective um, right now. <laughs> and, and so... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> what, what I'm going to suggest is that, um, and you've had, um, you've d- d- demonstrated tremendous leadership this year during a, a very tumultuous time for our college. And I would like to see us as a board, and this is discussion, obviously it's just one person's opinion now, the five, um, that we asked Terry to serve another year as chair, um, and I think hopefully a much more enjoyable year as chair, <laughs> whereas a, 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 a calm year as chair as we, as we um, deal with the normal course of the, the business of our college. Um, I know that's putting a burden on you, Terry, but given the political circumstance, I think that's the responsible thing for our board to do. Um, I would ask your consideration to serve again as vice chair um, and uh, help out in any way I can. But I would like to just, I guess, it, we're discussing it today because we can't make any motion our, our, our <coughs> meetings next time. But I think it's proper that we talk about it now rather than sure. don't do any planning and just go into the July meeting and we all sit there and look at each other. Go ahead. Ken, I I might disagree with you there. Um, I know full well what you're talking about. There's going to be some changes politically. Um, I don't know who's going to come out as governor right now. Um, You don't, Dick? (laughs) (laughs) No, I really don't. Uh, Um, don't. (laughs) um, What's happening is beyond my belief that uh, 
but that's what the electric will they'll do. They'll do something, I'm sure. Um, and I know that Deborah and I are, are already, we're serving out our term. And for, I think either one of us to be considered for a position is, uh, would be short term. I don't think that's, and I wouldn't want to do it myself anyways. I don't know about Deborah, I'll let him speak for himself. Uh, Terry has had a tough time. Um, he's had a full agenda, and for his sake, I'd like to see us swap those positions that you talked about, Ken. Um, that Terry serve as a vice chair, and you serve as the chair, because you're going to have a whole year anyways. Um, yeah. And I'm just thinking of, of Terry a little bit. I don't know what his thoughts are, because he hasn't spoken up. I'm surprised he hasn't just run away this <laughs> last year and said, this, is, this, is, this job isn't worth it, you know. You're the vice chairman. Unless we doubled his salary or something, we could do that, maybe entice him to stay on. But uh, my thought would, Ken, if I was here, I'd make the motion the other way. Well, I'll respond to that. I would prefer uh, still that Terry serve, knowing that he could, will be on the board the full year. And I would appreciate if I'm reappointed and if it works out and there's a lot of ifs in there, um, <laughs> that I would serve the following year. And if not, then Terry has four new partners to dance with at that time. <laughs> Given the, uh, the political climate, I think that's probably a smart thing because, you know, um, if we were talking a month and a half, two months ago, we'd almost for sure say that McCullum was going to win the governor's race. And today, Rick Scott <laughs> is coming on very strong as well as, um, you know, um, some other folks that are spending a bunch of money. So I think it's probably smart with Terry being the only person that's going to be able to serve out, you know, the next year for sure. And if Mr. Scott gets in the office, I can tell you he's probably going to do some wholesale, um, <laughs> I wouldn't say firing, but house cleaning. And uh, he's going to put his folks in. So uh, I think that's probably a smart thing to do if Terry would consider doing that. I think it's probably a smart thing to do. I know you have family and business obligations and other things, but I think it would be smart on our, on our behalf because, we, I, I, you know, I would say right now that if, 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 if the governor doesn't appoint, appoint Dick and I uh, prior to November, it will probably be February, I would imagine, um, before the person is going to be able to get to the Board of Trustees. There, there are going to be so many positions to appoint. So. Uh, and so I would imagine that we'd be here through February and then May, uh, it, it depends on how the office works. Some, uh, some people do this very quickly, some don't. Um, and so I would imagine that, that, that if that happens, there's going to be a lot of changes and we, we need to be prepared for that. And this board needs to have some stability and I think Terry would provide that. Okay. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, I am thrilled to do whatever is in the best interest of the college. I have no problem in serving another year as chair if that is the direction that we want to go. Uh, I want to make a comment about this last year, too. This last year, uh, I would not trade that experience for anything because, granted, we had some challenging times, but I think, uh, I think it was a good path, and I, I'm, I'm glad I was a part of it. I, uh, uh, I'm not ready to do it again this next year, but <laughs> I, I, I think it was great, and I, I'm, I was very, very happy that I was a part of that. Uh, Ken, you deserve to be the chairman. Um, you should be the chairman. And my inclination is that you be sitting here starting next month, and I'm happy to serve as vice chair, and we'll be happy to step up if that day ever comes where you are unable to serve. Um, that would be my first recommendation because I, I, I don't know the politics, but I happen to think uh, that if you agreed to that, you'd, you'd serve out a full year. I just, I just believe that's the way it will, will, will flow. And if not, I will be happy to, to move into that position. Uh, but I'll do whatever the, the pleasure of the board is. And I'm happy to continue on as chair. It's, I have no problem with that. So well, I guess we go to the next meeting, but I'm fine with the team in place, and I would appreciate you okay. serving another year. And Dick, I appreciate your nice comments. Thank you. Well, that's just the way I feel. I think it's a, uh, I, I think we put Terry through an awful lot. I think it'd be good for him to back off a little bit 
he has his own business, his own family, and uh, what's happened to him this last year is, I'm sure, very trying on him because um, he's done an excellent job. And, and Ken, you're well qualified. Um, you've done it before. You know what the chair is all about. And since you brought it up, I just thought I'd voice my concern. I have no idea what Evelyn would think. Um, kind of up to her to voice her own concerns if she has some. But we'll we'll know we'll know next uh, month. And as I said uh, earlier to Kim, um, our scheduled date. I'm jumping ahead. I'd like to be here for that meeting, and I know I can't be because I'll be at a funeral in Washington, D.C. Uh, those couple days, and so uh, I'm hoping we can change that when we get to the agenda. Okay. Can we decide that now since sure. we're on that topic? Sure. There's one board member can be, uh, as long as there's a quorum present, can be on. on I think it's nice if we could arrange it for all of us to be here. We've tried to do that, I mean, as much as we can. I'm just talking about and that. You can. Well, right, but I just, as I said, I'd like to be here for that meeting. Um, not that that's, that not that I have to be, but. Dick, when do you leave? I'm leaving on Friday the 16th and we'll get back on Wednesday the 21st. Um, Thursday the 22nd or 23rd, because Kim said she doesn't like to go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't worry about that. I, we got said to do that. Okay. <laughs> that, that we worry about that. Tw Twenty seconds fine with me. No, it's fine with me. You okay? To Twenty. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll move whatever I have. Okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and make the motion that we have. Um, and to help me with the wording, just just announce that we have a our regular board meeting scheduled for. Um, July 20th moved to July 22nd at the normal time and location. What day is that? Thursday. That's a Thursday. Thursday, July 22nd. Thank you all. Great. Okay. Great. We have a we have a motion. Can I have a second, please? Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Chair, we we typically move the meetings around. I'd like us to, to continue to try to do that to other sites to continually try to move the meetings around the campuses? Okay. We'll do that. Okay. Because I think we should, if there's potential land down at Midtown, we should get down there and at least look at what we're buying or something. Can you, can you arrange that for us? I just think we should be accessible to the, to the, the some of the instructors and the students can attend some of the meetings. Well, that's true. And because uh, we meet here because it's convenient, but, uh, uh, we hardly ever get to Tarpon Springs because it's so far away, but it's part of our purview. It's That's because Conferly wasn't a good host. <laughs> 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 we'll give him a second chance. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Forgive me. Okay, thank you. We have uh, some presentations uh, from Dr. Cooper. And Dr. Cooper, before you start, I would like to recognize some folks who are here. Um, we are privileged to have several members of the Board of the Directors of Lipa Ratner here with us this morning. Uh, one, of course, is our own board member, Evelyn Bilirakis, who serves on the Development Committee. We also have three other members of the board, uh, and I'd like for you to stand and be recognized as I call your name, please. Uh, Ms. Lynn Pearson, who is the chairperson of the Board of Directors. We also have Dr. Jonathan Steele, who is a board member and also uh, on the Education and Outreach Committee and is the Dean of Fine Arts and Humanities here at St. Pete College. And we have Mrs. Maria Edmonds, who, Maria, are you here? Okay. <laughs> She's a great lady. We also have a couple of members of the Lipa Ratner senior staff. Uh, we have the museum director, Mr. Lynn Whitelaw, Sir, and the coordinator of development and grants, Dr. Janice Buchanan. So thank you all very much for being with us. <laughs> Dr. Cooper. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Law, thank you. 
This morning we'd like to take a little time to share some information about the wonderful opportunities we are providing to our students and our community in the arts. And, and we'd also like to answer any questions that you have in that regard. I'd like to give a little overview of a wealth of research that's been done over the last 20 years that has looked at the value of arts and student success. What we find in this research is that it increases academic performance, it reduces absenteeism, it develops cognitive, social, and personal competencies, it improves self-esteem, it makes important connections to the world outside of the classroom, and it reaches students who are not otherwise being reached. So we at St. Petersburg College are impacting and engaging our students in ways many other colleges do not offer. Sometimes the arts are viewed as irrelevant to getting a job, or only part of the core academic mission if one has special talent and is majoring in the arts. However, when we look at research that was done by a McKinsey study in 2001 called The War for Talent, 6,000 executives from 400 companies were asked what is the biggest challenge they are facing in today's society? Finding people who can make good decisions in times of uncertainty and who can adapt to new opportunities and respond creatively to change. If we look at a quote from Sir Ken Robinson, I think he best uh, says what we are attempting to accomplish here at St. Petersburg College. If America wants to remain competitive in the global markets of the 21st century, creativity is not a luxury. America needs a workforce that is flexible, adaptable, and highly creative, and it needs an education system that can develop these qualities in everyone. So the arts encourage these kinds of skills and aptitudes and values that are the heart of America's growing creative economy and beyond. I'd like to take a moment and share some of the accomplishments that we are uh, achieving at uh, various <laughs> venues in the arts. First with the Lipa Ratna Museum, as you can see, our student vi visits are increasing. The number of faculty holding classes at the museum are increasing. We're also increasing in the number of community outreach programs, and we're very proud of what's happening. Uh, at the Downtown Cultural Center, our students are, perform are able to attend performances, and many times these are students who wouldn't otherwise have access to these types of art venues. We also have artists and performers that are giving our students master classes, and in fact, our music industry recording arts program is better than any of the others in the state of Florida because our students are able to intern at the Palladium and actually learn how to mix sounds for different types of art performances. And there's a lot of difference between uh, doing that for, say, an opera versus uh, rock and roll or some other uh, music uh, genre. So we have uh, even better than what Full Sail is able to offer their students. And in addition to these aforementioned uh, venues, each campus provides various opportunities for sharing the arts. I know there was a question raised at our last board meeting in regards to the usage of the Palladium. And as you can see, we are increasing in regards to the number of rehearsals and events and performances uh, that are taking place. And so, St. Petersburg College serves as a leading cultural center for our students and our community. And we're very proud of that. And we <coughs> want to thank the board for their support. And we know there are challenges uh, that we face when state budgets are uh, shrinking and endowments are shrinking. But we feel that the value far outweighs the price. Just like to share a little bit about the staffing at the Lipa Ratna Museum. As you know, the Lipa Ratna is a uh, 501c3 organization, so it has a board of directors and a museum director. And when you think about uh, other museums of this size, we do have, a, um, I think, a, a staff that does an outstanding job in all that they are able to provide to our students in our community. In regards to the Downtown Cultural Arts Center, we have several venues, the Palladium, 
the Florida International Museum, and then the box office. And what we are attempting to do is to shift the uh, percentage of duties of the various staff members uh, <coughs> as we come to a um, end of the agreement for the Florida International Museum. And so those staff are shifting more of their attention back to the Palladium so that we continue to improve upon what we're able to offer. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Doug Duncan, who's going to talk uh, about the financial aspects associated with the various art venues. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's yeah, I was going to start by saying this will give you a frame of reference, but I'm not going to use the term <laughs> frame. <laughs> 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 uh, <coughs> This is the, the next few slides will give you just a, an overview of a financial summary of the arts programs. And probably the most significant, this top, the top box here represents actual expenses this fiscal year through June 2nd. Uh, you can see each, each program uh, has varying uh, deficit levels from the Palladium at 284. 284,000, uh, FIM at 316,000, the box office 35, approximately 35,900, and Leaper Ratner uh, approximately 500,000. The total of about 1.15 uh, 1 million uh, represents a, a little less than 1% of the college's budget. So in, while it's a large number uh, relative to the entire budget, it's less than 1%. Of the, of the total, uh, Doug, yes. Can you put that in perspective? for us, um, how much do we spend on athletics? I don't have the number, but I can get it for you. It's uh, Tanjim. That's mostly coming out of the student activities budget, but I can get you that number. Thank you. Okay. Of the, uh, of the, total, of the total revenue, the, the Palladium generates uh, about 83% of that. Now keep in mind, these numbers are strictly from the college books. Uh, Lee Peratner has its own books as a 501c3, so this represents only the, the college side of it. The, um, the total revenue represents about 51% of the, of the deficit. On the lower side is really just the, the projected budgets for next year, which are also showing about, collectively, about a $1 million deficit. So. I'm sorry, I'm confused by what you said with Lee Peratner. These figures do not include monies that are in the separate foundation for Lipa Ratner? They're well, this, these, these numbers are strictly from the numbers reflected on the college's books. In other words, the revenue that, that we receive, the uh, expenses that we incur. Okay. The, the 501c3 has its own books of, of revenue and so on. And I'll, I can... But the but all the personnel for Lipa Ratner is paid for by the college, is that correct? No. Well, no, there is a, a portion, a contribution that is made by the 501c3 to part of the personnel. And that's offset this figure here? So this These numbers include any offsets. Right. Right. If you look at the bottom on the budget portion, the 42 uh, of revenue is showing the contribution the projected contribution to the personnel from the from the Leaper Ratner from the 501c3. Okay. In other words, this money that the, the college puts out is what sustains the operation. But it doesn't Primarily. sustain itself. Right. Yes. Mr. Ms. Burke, can I be sure? I, I sent you a rev we revised this briefly yesterday, so I, I, I hope we're on the same page. That's page one. Page two. I want to be careful. I I um I do CPA talk. <laughs> through a translator, um, but I want to be sure that what we're what we're showing you. If I understand in our walkthrough yesterday, the money for the personnel is that we they transfer the funds and we hire the people. So we're trying to put everything in one place so you can see the total cost of personnel is five hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. Okay. That, that's net after we receive some reimbursement that, from the foundation. And the reimbursement would be the 42941 which is 
revenue that they transfer to us to, right. to do right. that. Am I speaking yes. correctly? Yes. Okay. Correct. Now, does the Palladium have, I thought when, when we got the Palladium, Mr. Huff gave us some type of endowment for operations. We have yes. not, we have not I'll show you that on, I've got that on another slide to show you. But okay. does that, are his, is that endowment figures considered in the Palladium operating cost here of the negative 284? It is considered only to the extent that there, at currently there, there's not a revenue going into the um, to the operating bud side of the Palladium right now because it, it is not it's underwater basically. In other words, we can only spend what is above the I believe it's the five million mark. And you'll see on my last slide that okay, it's under that right thing. now. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, let me just show you a, a year over year on the Palladium on the palladium side where you can see that revenues have increased uh, gradually each year where the, the uh, 09 10 of course is just through June 2nd we expect when we close the books that will be uh, much higher than that and then to the far right is just the projected budget of the palladium for next year so you're showing a um, increased revenue slightly decreased expense up until uh, the next year where, as, as Ann mentioned, the, uh, the, the personnel from the FIM will go back into the Palladium budget. So that's why the 606, 606,000 is reflecting a slightly larger number from earlier. Mm -hmm. well, on these revenues, we get a, um, Susan tells us we get like, whatever it is, $7 per square foot from the state on all our buildings yes. so is that revenue put in here as revenue <clears throat> it is not reflected in here as the revenue and most of that operating costs and new facilities also supports uh, custodial support those kind of things that we provide that are also not reflected in these in these numbers but, so the uh, you're you are correct though we do get operating costs and new facilities for the plating but you're saying that the what those expenses that what that money is for is not the cost of it is not reflected in here. Right. Okay. So, so it would be a wash. Is that what you're saying? Uh, close to that. Yes, it would be. Yes. These utilities. So utilities and the the custodial care and the operations care cost are not included in these figures, but the income we receive from the states also not included in these figures. Okay. Thanks. What is that, by the way? Is it how much is that per square foot now, Susan? It's seven dollars and twenty-two cents this uh, coming year. <coughs> uh, the last slide, uh, Mr. Burke, goes to your your question on the endowments. <coughs> the Palladium has. Currently, we've received a gift from Mr. Huff of $3 million. We got a $2 million state match, and, and that was the endowment amount of $5 million. So we can uh, incorporate revenue beyond $5 million to, and put it toward the revenue on the Palladium. However, uh, investments so on right now, you'll see that uh, it is currently at about $4.8 in investments, and so we're hoping that as a potential source of revenue that will we'll get over the $5 million mark so that we can then start. Uh, so as long as it's under $5 million, we can't use the revenue? Right. Oh. That's correct. Okay. Mr. Doug, did we also receive another anonymous gift on the Palladium? Not that I'm, you want to, Susan May. We still have. This is a, what I'm showing here is the endowment, so there are obviously okay, memberships so and other the, the, the renovations yes um, part of the um, agreement was that um, mr. Huff would try and come to the table with some additional money for construction he was able in about a three-month period of time to raise over a half a million dollars he gave us the half a million dollars we matched it at that time with the facilities okay. enhancement challenge grant so we had over a million dollars to put towards the renovations that you've seen yeah. over the years at the Palladium. Okay. And, and we currently have 
patrons who pay twenty five thousand dollars a year that's that's still active that that's our olympian sponsors that's one of the things i'm going to talk about when i go over the palladium and i would like to tell you that it's as active as it once was but because of the economy and things it's not quite that active anymore we do have still have a few participants at that number but um, you'll see many of them are have dropped off that amount okay uh, on the Leaper Ratner <coughs> endowment it uh, began with a 2.5 million dollar gift and 500,000 of that was used for construction and it currently sits at about 1.97 uh, million which is invested I, I also just wanted to show at the on the 501c3 books that the net assets for 2010 are at right about 1.3 million of that about 389,000 is cash so that's that's on the the 501c3 side okay I also got a note here that uh, the the athletic is about 1.2 million so very close number to that helps put it in perspective yeah Thank you, Doug. Next, I'd like to introduce the uh, provost, Confolite Carney, of the Tarpon Springs campus, who's going to share. One, one more thing on the on the income on the Palladium. Does that include the the, the jazz club, or um, is that a lease type of operation, or is that something we run ourselves? Um, the, the, you're, I think you're referring to the side door, which we call the side door jazz. That's um, downstairs in the Stavros room, and that is something that we operate ourselves. So oftentimes when you see uh, performers in there, they will either be a, a group which we brought in under Palladium Presents, or it will be somebody that's renting um, that room, and so we would receive revenue from that rental. Okay, so has that proved to break even, that operation down um, there? I can't answer that question off the top of my head. I, you know, we run every performance, every event that we have in quick book, so I can kind of come back and give you a sense of what that would be. So, some things will pay more revenue than others. An example will be the, the opera that was just upstairs. Um, we will make about $10,000 off that opera. Is that because we re rented the facility to the St. Pete Opera Company and it was really their operation Correct. or do we, Correct. is that, that how that works? That is not something that, that, we, uh, that we buy, so to speak. That is the St. Pete Opera. They come in, they rent the hall, and they rent it also for the days where they do rehearsal. Right. So okay. it's, a, it's a pretty good uh, rental for us. It was a great show, too. And it was a great show, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wilburn. <laughs> yeah, there's someplace. It's good. Good morning again, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Good morning. And I especially want to thank Mr. Johnston for that compliment earlier about my uh, <laughs> legacy on the financial side. <laughs> we'll talk again about that. The seven strategies going forward for the Leaper Rat Museum are a subset of a more comprehensive strategic plan that was adopted by the Board of Directors of the Leaper Atten Museum in early 2009. Um, these seven, however, I think are key in that they will allow us to continue to build on the educational value that the Leaper Atten Museum represents to this college and to the community. It will allow us to uh, move towards accreditation, which we're very excited about, and it will allow us to improve the financial health of the Leaper Atten Museum. These seven, in my opinion, are realistic, they are achievable, they're measurable, and probably most important, they represent the collaborative and commitment of the senior staff of the museum, as well as myself as campus provost, as well as the members of the board of directors that are here today. The continuing the enhancement of museum programs, uh, you saw the numbers that Dr. Cooper shared before, we have over five uh, 5,000 students visiting the museum in a year. Uh, we want to certainly build on that and the value that it represents to our students. Um, that, that number is driven primarily by the integration of the museum experience with the classroom experience. 
particularly in terms of fine arts and humanities and in terms of creative writing where students and faculty from those disciplines come into the museum with assignments for uh, homework or um, essays or what have you. And so we certainly want to build on that. Part of that, uh, our strategy was to bring into the Education and Outreach Committee of the Board of Directors, uh, Dr. Jonathan Steele, our Dean from Fine Arts and Humanities. We're also looking forward to bringing in another one of our deans to expand on that uh, value to our students. Uh, we also have a, a robust uh, community outreach a partnership with Pinellas County School Systems and with the library systems in Northern Pinellas County, uh, where we have, for example, family uh, reading that occurs at the museum. Uh, this year, coming in 2011, we will work with uh, Dr. Connolly to make the Leaper Ratner Museum a site for college for kids. We're very excited about that. And also in 2011, we will be uh, getting on loan from Pinellas County School System, an art mobile that was previously used by the Dolly Museum for the last four years. And we will decorate that uh, art mobile with St. Petersburg logo, the Leaper Ratner Museum logo. And that art mobile will rotate throughout the elementary schools uh, in Pinellas County over the next four years. And of course, having contact with students, we will also pass our literature out and membership literature out uh, as a part of that art mobile uh, initiative as well. So we certainly want to continue to build on the educational values that our art uh, museum programs offer to our colleagues and to the community. Uh, we're very excited about moving forward with achieving and leveraging accreditation by the American Association of, of Museums. And there are 17,500 museums in this country, of which 6% are fully accredited, about 1,060 or so. Of those, 15% are museums, about 160, that are connected with colleges and universities. And so by achieving accreditation by the American Association of Museums, we will be able to leverage national prestige, we'll, be, we'll have access to higher uh, grant amounts, and we'll have access to the highest caliber of exhibitions, which I think will also help us improve the financial help of the museum. We do have a detailed schedule for accreditation, uh, which starts this uh, in August. We'll submit our application for accreditation. Uh, this afternoon, the board of directors uh, for the museum will be convening for the first time the subcommittee on accreditation oversight. And uh, there's a lot of momentum uh, going towards accreditation. We expect to submit our application in August of this year, and it's a two and a half year to three year process. So we expect to achieve accreditation in late 2012 or early 2013. And that will be, I believe, a feather in our hat. Uh, fitting for a college that has a national reputation, I think it's only fit that our museum also have a national reputation and prestige. Uh, in terms of growing the foundation endowment, which Doug just talked about, the 1. million. We have a structured fundraising plan in place. There's three components of that plan. One is naming rights for the entire museum complex. We have qualified prospects for that. We have a goal of raising, raising that endowment by $3 million just for naming rights. When I say qualified pr prospects, I'm talking about prospects who are either uh, conversations have already taken place with or they have already given gifts to the museum, or they are, have a special relationship with the college. And Dr. Buchanan is working on that, and we'll have that ready for review by our, our new president, who will get working on raising that uh, endowment. We think that we can raise the endowment over the strategic plan period, which is 2009 to 2014, by another $5 million, and then use the earnings off of that, uh, the total amount, to uh, offset funding from the college side. Conferly, we're not going to have the 1-800-ASK-GARY-LEEPER-RATNER museum, are we? <laughs> Say 1-800? Whatever it was. We didn't write that one. We have a similar strategy also for, for raising um, the cash assets, with, which Do Doug talked really about. We have $489,000 in cash, CDs, and checking. And we can raise that. We believe we have a five-point strategy to increase that, starting with uh, business and corporate sponsorships. Uh, increasing the profit margin on our annual fundraising and increasing grant uh, applications and funding. There are other strategies as part of raising that as well. Uh, our membership has remained fairly stable over the, even this down economy. Right now we stand at uh, 402 paid uh, members of the museum. 70% uh, of those members are from Pinellas County. 
10% uh, are from Hillsborough County, 15% from Pasco, uh, about 2% are from uh, other counties in Florida, and 3% are from outside the state of Florida. Uh, so we're looking at growing memberships throughout um, the, those count surrounding counties as well as the state of Florida and leveraging that national prestige that I talked about with regards to the accreditation. Uh, we especially want to grow our memberships in the college family and alumni. Uh, we're disappointed with that penetration right now. We've talked about in our art council a possible combination membership between the Palladium and the museum or a reciprocal type of membership where if you are a member of the Palladium, you get a discount at the museum, or if you're a member of the museum, you get a discount at Palladium. So we're working through penetrating, increasing the penetration of college, family, and alumni in terms of membership. Um, we have a strategy in place to contain and reduce through the future uh, the funding from the college. We've already started that. Small amount, as you saw in the chart from Doug, we have three positions that are either fully or partly uh, funding from museum operations back to the college. In addition to that, there's a $24,000 insurance policy that the college used to pay that's now being paid by the museum side. And we have an understanding in place that to carry out our strategic plan, if there are additional costs to carry it out, those costs will have to be borne by the private side of the museum. Um, last but not least, we have an opportunity to evolve the leadership of the uh, museum to accomplish these strategies that I'm sharing with you. Uh, I have been uh, informed that uh, our coordinator of development and grant writing, Dr. Buchanan, plans to retire very soon. Also, our founding director has indicated that he will have 30 years in the, in the FRS system uh, in about a year and a half. And uh, he's, 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 he's willing to stay on through the accreditation, but in a different mm -hmm. role. So we have an opportunity and a proposal on the table to take three existing positions within the museum, redefine those positions in terms of a, a director who would focus on fundraising and, and, and grants, uh, a museum curator, which would, uh, is required for accreditation, and then taking an existing public relations position and making that position a public relations and a grant support position. So I'm looking forward to working with the new leadership at the college to review that proposal, uh, get those, those new positions um, graded in terms of salary. Uh, we think that can be done budget neutral or very near budget neutral. And so uh, we'd like to make that happen as quickly as possible. I think, in my mind, that is one of the most critical success factors in achieving the strategies that I've shared with you this, this morning. Thank you. Confident? Yes. yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Mr. Gibbons. Um, two things. One is, um, do we have to have our own um, curator, or can we share a curator with all the other uh, Groups that are the out requirement there. is to have is it, we, we would prefer to have our own curator. Uh, I've not not evaluated having a shared curator. The one of the requirements also of accreditation is that they would prefer, would prefer not to have our current director change during the, the accreditation process. So if we take our current director and move him to a full time curator, in which he will focus on those higher caliber highest caliber ex exhibition and planning for exhibition for the next two or three years, I think that would bode well for the accreditation process. And in, in growing the membership, um, consider like um, there are groups like the Tampa Bay Society as well as um, country clubs and I know that a lot of folks that are involved in those groups typically are involved in the arts venues marketing to those groups. We have looked at ways of getting a younger clientele into the membership of our museum looking at the you don't get a younger clientele at that group. You don't get a younger clientele, but you'll get some people probably. Well, we are. I mean, we really want to. We want to grow that membership, and we'll look and we're open to all opportunities, and we, we take that one uh, to heart as well. It may be another way of raising money. Most of those folks that are members of country clubs usually are like members of the Tampa Bay Society, and they they get tickets to different things, and they will market your events and so on as a part of their um, group. So, and two, they're all our members. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Conferly. It's my pleasure now to introduce Yvonne Olmer, the uh, CEO of our downtown campus, who's going to share some strategies for the downtown cultural center with you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, and good morning, all. Good morning. St. Pete College downtown is considered the cultural hub of the downtown uh, community. Uh, 
Located in the heart of downtown St. Petersburg, our students have many opportunities to interact with the arts. <coughs> Excuse me. Going forward, what we'd like to do is to create even more opportunities for student performance uh, and for their attendance uh, at arts events. Additionally, we want to continue to strengthen our collaborative efforts with our cultural partners. Currently, American Stage Theater and the uh, Pier Aquarium have their <coughs> summer camps uh, on our site which is just wonderful to, to see all of the, the children coming through the doors with their families and gives uh, our campus great exposure. Uh, also, our student activity events for both downtown and midtown are focused on introducing and engaging students in the arts. We take students to see American Stage Theater in the park. Uh, we take them to hear performances by the Florida Orchestra at the Mahaffey Theater. And this fall, we're coordinating with the Palladium to have a <coughs> New Orleans Jazz Fest for our students. <coughs> but as the college demonstrates its support to the arts, our partners in turn provide discounts to our faculty, staff, and students for their events. American Stage uh, Theater allows us to use their theater uh, for special events and lectures and uh, guest speakers that we have on campus. Additionally, this year, a really nice package that American Stage is offering is we expect to hire about 50 new faculty and administrative staff, and each of those new faculty and staff will get what's called a flex package of six tickets to the free to the American Stage Theater that they can use for the 2010-2011 season any way that they would like to use it. If they'd like to bring their whole family, use the six tickets for one performance, they can do that or they can parcel them out. And that is just a, a real terrific, uh, I think, gift uh, to the college family of those tickets. Um, as far as uh, some future opportunities with our box office, our joint box office, we have been approached by some other venues asking, you know, would you be able to sell our tickets? Like the Chihuly collection that's coming along, uh, also Grand Prix, Janus Landing uh, events. And once all of our partners are on the same software, that's something that we may want to entertain Smart. in terms of uh, being able to gener generate some revenues by selling tickets at our joint box office for them. Clearly, SBC Downtown's identity is and will continue to be closely associated with the arts community. We're, we're very proud of that and we know mm -hmm. that it does very valuable things for our students. As we are moving forward uh, with some of the initiatives, our agreement with the city to have cultural offerings at the Florida International Museum will conclude in December 2010. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, but not least, I'd like to introduce Susan Ryder, who's going to share some strategies in regards to going forward on, at the Palladium. Great loss for us. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the strategies and initiatives that we have at the Palladium <coughs> this year for um, increasing programming and also uh, increasing our revenue. Um, we are going to look seriously at establishing an advisory board to lead uh, fundraising initiatives. Uh, the Palladium became part of St. Petersburg College in February 2007, and that agreement asked that we set up an advisory board of around 20 people uh, with no less than five and no more than seven uh, former members of the Palladium Board of Directors. So we intend to do that. We have uh, many of the, our past members have uh, asked that they be represented or somebody from their family on that board. So we intend to have that board in place by uh, October 1st and then have them help us with planning strategies for a fundraising campaign and uh, individual uh, fundraising initiatives. We are developing a new membership brochure and fundraising materials. Um, we're uh, going to have that done by the fall. 
um, and a major push this year will be for us to identify groups with special interests that enjoy uh, performances at the Palladium, such as the opera, the uh, encore series, the jazz, contemporary, blues, rock, the, some of us remember the oldies, and to target those groups for memberships at the Palladium. Um, and one of the things that we would strongly like to encourage this year is to have the college family come forward and be members in the Palladium. So with that, I am going to um, give this to Dr. Law. <laughs> I, I was more interested in the free tickets from Yvonne. <laughs> <laughs> just, just call, we'll fix you right up. <laughs> um, we have applied for 100,000 Bank of America neighbors, uh, Neighborhood Builders Grant this year through our foundation. And that grant uh, provides financial support for community organizations that would be interested in having performances at the Palladium but don't have the financial availability to do that. Uh, so we're hoping that that grant will come through. Um, as you know, the grants for the arts this year are um, in pretty dismal shape. So. Uh, we're fairly limited as all of the other cultural and arts organizations are but that will be a uh, new initiative for us as we move forward and as those grants become available um, we're going to pursue those with uh, vigor uh, the Olympian sponsors that you asked us about the $25,000 sponsors uh, between the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009 we attracted four major Olympia sponsors those are at the $25,000 level but this was not the case last year so we're going to refocus our energies um, on that Olympian campaign and work with our advisory board and with the St. Petersburg College Foundation uh, so that we can they can assist us with uh, with uh, talking to those larger donors we've had some conversation today about some joint marketing there's a lot of good ideas around um, we want to focus on that also with our partners, American Stage, the Florida Orchestra, the Pier Aquarium, uh, the Morian Arts Center, the Dolly, some of the other local galleries. Uh, essentially, um, I, market, I market your entity on the Palladium material and you market the Palladium on your playbills, that type of thing. So I think there's a lot of opportunities as we move forward here for all of our organizations. Um, we want to recruit sponsorships for our Palladium Presents events, similar to the Encore series this year. Uh, this past year marked the 10th anniversary of our Encore series, and it was privately uh, funded for all of the concerts. You might remember one of the concerts um, was supported by Al May, and he had a special piece written for him. Uh, that was the largest attendant Encore uh, presentation that oh, we had. Wow. It was absolutely absolutely marvelous and and wonderful for Al May um, great guy he is um, we had sponsors for comedian uh, and songwriter Jim Stafford and for Jeffrey Siegel Jeffrey Siegel will be back again this year we're hoping to get again uh, supporters for that he will also be doing a master class for our students when he comes um, and we're going to be looking for not just major donors but small donors sometimes somebody coming forward with a $500 check helps us greatly um, and we're going to target more of those uh, small donations this year. One of the things that um, our executive director recognized this past year was that there were times that the Palladium was unused in the, in the daytime if we didn't have any rehearsals here. So he has uh, implemented a program where business organizations and associates can use either the Huff Hall or the Stavros room for lunches and business meetings. That has proven to be very successful this past year, and we're going to encourage more of that as we move forward. Um, we want to continue to enhance our relationships with major concert producers. We will have new sound equipment in the Palladium this year. Um, it will be Pro Tools. It will be the same equipment that our mirror students are using at the St. Pete Gibbs campus. And that's the type of equipment that promoters need to have in a hall when they bring a larger show. If you don't have that type of equipment, then they have to go out and rent that equipment and bring it in. And that's an additional expense for them. So we will have eliminated that. So we're looking at attracting 
larger shows, um, more prominent shows, um, and a higher ticket price on those shows also. So we will be state of the art, and that's going to be great for us. And where's, um, where's that coming from? Because I thought in the, there's zero listed here for capital. It's um, in, in that in the financial you gave us. It's it's coming out of the overall college's um, capital budget that was approved this past year. Um, we have a we have a number of items that are listed college wide for improvements in capital, and it's coming out of that budget list that was at the May board meeting. Okay. So why isn't it including capital under here under the proposed budget or is that Be not here? Because it's not coming out of this pocket of funds. It's in a separate pocket of funds that the college has. I'm speaking for Doug now. Set aside for okay. capital replacement, capital equipment, college wide. I guess my question is, you know, we're trying to get an accurate financial account here. If we didn't have the palladium would that money still be there and be used for some other source within the college i would have to say it would be sure. yes okay sure so that should be on the financial statement for the palladium then for I, me I, I think i have to take responsibility i was trying to focus us on the operating budget okay. uh, problems but I'll, let, we'll come back with anyway that. we just have zero listed yeah. here i just Is that would, no big deal. There would likely be equipment purchases and okay. things that they come out of the operating kind of thing. Uh, all the initiatives listed above are focused on increasing the bookings that will assist us in the bottom line over the next fiscal year. We already have the months of September, December, January, and June almost entirely reserved. Bookings are up already 50% for next fiscal year. The St. Pete Opera has committed to three shows for next year. And as I mentioned, Jeffrey Siegel will be back in the spring and will be doing master classes. Um, just a couple other things about the Palladium. Um, Dr. Cooper mentioned the student participation and the fact that we use the Palladium as one of the MIRA program labs. Um, our students participate and actually um, have some of their performances at the Palladium and use some of the equipment. They use the Skinner organ there. They participated in musical concerts of all kinds. The United <coughs> States Air Force Band, they participated with them. Uh, they had two mirror showcases. So the students actually come over to the Palladium and they have done their um, end of the year showcase at the Palladium. Um, just in a sort of an anecdote, I was at the Palladium a couple of Friday evenings ago. There was a um, young blues rock kind of a performer and we uh, had his CD release party downstairs in, in the jazz room. Um, and I looked over to the mixing board over there and here was Tom who was doing our mixing for us and there looked to be a, a young kid who was about 12 years old. And so I looked at him and I thought, well, isn't that nice? Tom's brought his son, showing him how this works and everything. So during intermission, Tom brought the kid over and uh, introduced me to him. His name was Connor, and he's a student in our MIRA program. And so he was in there getting some experience on this particular type of performance at the Palladium in the hall downstairs. And what we find with the MIRA students is they participate in almost every uh, event that we have at the Palladium not required by their classes but because they get a different experience and have a different opportunity so it's very well received by the students thank you very much thank you. we're close to the end here are we not yes, good well, <laughs> as, as you can see, the members of the Art Council are very passionate about what we're able to offer our students, our college family, and the community through the arts, and we're very proud of what St. Petersburg College is accomplishing. Any questions? I have, I have a, a couple of comments and a, and a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the board members and staff members and director of LIPA for being with us this morning and taking the time to uh, sit with us for a couple hours. Uh, and your presence here is, is very much appreciated. And the hard work that you're doing, uh, I have served on boards of cultural arts institutions. And the thing about it is, is that 
there is a continual struggle, even in good economic times. Uh, if it's the Florida Orchestra or the Morian Arts Center or American Stage, all the arts, every year, it's a struggle to keep afloat. And it looks like, really, that you're, you're on the right path. The numbers are all going in the right direction, and I just commend you. Uh, I, I can't say enough good things about that. That's very, very encouraging. Um, a couple of things about the Palladium, I think, that bode well for our future. Um, I've been involved in the Morian <coughs> Arts Center, and of course, the Shahuli collection is coming to town in July. <coughs> uh, back when Mr. Shahuli's uh, collection was shown down at the Museum of Fine Arts in 05, there was 190,000 people that came through that museum in a period of four months to see that collection. And the Palladium is about, I think, four or five blocks from uh, where the new Shahuli collection is going to be. So I think there's going to be some incredible opportunities to do some partnering. Uh, even with, you know, I know the, the Morian were talking about doing some shared tickets with the uh, Museum of Fine Arts, with the Dali and others, and I, I would encourage you to explore that if you haven't done that already. Uh, there's going to be some great opportunities there. Um, there was no mention of the collection from the Gulf Coast Museum. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering where that is, what's happening with that. Um, is there, are there some plans for some future exhibitions of, the, of that collection? Uh, the Gulf Coast Museum collection is housed at the downtown center currently. Uh, we have been spreading the art through the campuses. Uh, there are various pieces being installed uh, on different sites. Uh, there were some opportunities for possible uh, loaning of various uh, portions or traveling some of, some of the uh, parts of that collection. Uh, for example, I know we had some of them on display at the uh, Tampa airport. Uh, there have been some that have been installed down at the new All Children's Hospital. Uh, so um, I believe we're doing as much as we can to get that out and so that the community have an opportunity. I know there are several pieces that are uh, have been or others that are going to be in some of the um, shows at the Lipa Ratner Museum. Um, any others? Uh, office building next uh, up in uh, Dr. Law's area. Take a look in the foundation, and you'll see some of that artwork around there. Great, great. <laughs> Mr. Gibbons. Um, I guess my question is to Susan and, and Dr. Alma, really. <clears throat> Do you think that there is a reason that the Palladium may not have done very well because we're competing against each other? We're about two blocks of each other, and would it make sense for us to work with American Stage more or figure out how to? bring that the two groups together and I'm not sure if that's one of the reasons that the Palladium hasn't done as well mm -hmm. in terms of his bookings <clears throat> well the this coming year um, we last year we had about 233 days <coughs> where we had something going on in the Palladium sure. rehearsals events that kind of thing so when you consider there's 365 days a year and 233 of them already have something in it and we're moving forward to try and book as many of those other days. Uh, I think what we need to do at the Palladium is figure out how to do those so that we are attracting um, shows that we can make more money on and do some things that we did this year like rent it to businesses and organizations when we're not using it so that we're getting revenue from it and those those types of events um, don't require us to do much we just need to be there open the door they have their event that type of thing so we need to be a little bit more creative our intention this year as we move the staff um, back over to the palladium is to really move forward with that the initiatives that i went through in the fundraising and um, again, in trying to increase the programs and in trying to increase the donations 
smaller donations for programs, which I think is something that we've really missed. We have a lot of um, partnerships with American Stage. Um, we are doing some things with them uh, over the summer, and um, you know they do one type of show. We have a, a small theater group coming in doing some musical shows. We've got six concerts coming in this summer. So um, when you look at the number, again, when you look at the number of days and the number of days you've got something going on. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunities, as you mentioned, to, to move forward and do more with our partners. Mr. Johnson. Um, just listening this morning, I think this was a very good uh, presentation. We have gotten ourselves involved in the arts kind of on a piecemeal basis without any real, in my mind, um, a master plan of how we handle this or, <coughs> excuse me, or how we go forward from here. And I, I know that we're all concerned about uh, budget issues uh, that was brought out and I think the discussion Mr. Burke had as far as the minutes go uh, from our last meeting and, and I'm a pessimist by heart as far as the state budget goes so I would assume that, that because of the oil spills and the rest of the economic conditions we'll probably get another cutback right. this year uh, very good likelihood of it whether it'll happen or not, I don't know but I, I think that what we should try to do with our, our arts program is more or less bring it together under a, either a committee head or a direct head so that uh, someone or one entity has got its fingers on the pulse because we have Leeper Ratner We've got uh, FIM, we have the Palladium, American Stage, the Florida Orchestra. We've done a lot of things, and there's more that I, there that uh, if, if we kind of had an arts coordinator, uh, this adds an extra cost, but maybe, maybe it might be worthwhile to think about somebody who had their, their finger on the pulse, because uh, we've got several people who've got to who participate in this. Um, and how much coordination and cooperation is probably, I think it's very good, but it's all volunteer <coughs> at this point in time. And, and maybe somehow or other, I guess what I'm saying is, can we bring our arts program together um, rather than being as loose as it is now, uh, just so that we have the answers to what is our total cost to run this, our total cost to run that. Um, and what is our direction we might like to take and say okay we'll take the palladium and and uh, we'll sell a naming rights to it or something um do do things that we're not doing just because they're different ideas and someone has the responsibility of uh, other than the, our president because this is just another division and when we've let it grow um, and it's a good thing we have because the community i know really is appreciative of what St. Petersburg College has done for the arts program. Uh, and, and maybe we had someone or some one designee uh, that would handle all this. I know I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, I'm trying to get to that point. Dr. Cooper, you're giving the presentation today. Are you not that person? Well, I am the chairman of the Art Council. Um, but if I understand correctly, I think Mr. Johnson is talking about a full-time individual who is focused on the arts and bringing the various venues and opportunities together. Well, I'm just concerned. Uh, I don't know how much. If, if you're the, the, the person, is, is this something that's been given to you and say, kind of take care of this? It's, uh, it's not your primary concern. And should we have somebody who it is their primary concern? Well, as the chairman of the Art Council, what I was asked to do is to bring together the various educational aspects of what we're doing in the various venues. And so we've been, the, the various members of the Art Council and I have been working on that. For example, coordinating calendars so we're not having a lot of conflicts, uh, complementing if a music program has this kind of show, uh, the museum might be wanting to 
carrying a collection that would complement that so that people would be interested in both. So we've been doing some of that coordination um, and I'll do whatever I can, but it's a, it would be a full-time job to coordinate college-wide all of the venues. Well, I didn't know whether we should even consider that or not. It was an idea that came to mind when I listened to various participants that would it pay us to have that one person who would report to the Arts Council and kind of be their executive director if you wanted to call it that. Mr. Burke. Um, thank you, uh, Terry. Uh, I appreciate the presentation. Um, I look at it this way. Um, we're an academic institution. That's our, our primary mission. Um, and most colleges which have great arts programs have them because they have good academic programs and the arts come from those academic programs. We've kind of done things in a little bit different style um, here at St. Pete College. Um, but I still would like to see uh, what you just said, the education mission of this. And I agree with, with Dick with his um, idea for a master plan because as part of that master plan needs to be a more serious academic integration of our arts program, in my opinion. Um, I was pleased. I went to the Opera Carmen. It was wonderful. And I, I was, happened to sit behind uh, Marilyn Masters. And she was so proud that her students were on the chorus up there. And what a wonderful opportunity for them. To, uh, none of them have ever done an opera in French before. Um, you know, there's not too many French operas. And, and she, um, she was just so proud and talked about teaching them. But I don't think any of them received credit for that. Um, that, was, that was their, um, and, and we need to integrate the, the credit part of this with, with the academics here. Um, and I look at other opportunities with museum management, um, theater management, um, but um, the sound, um, that's, that's big. And, and I'm not sure, do we have academic programs to go with what we're doing here? Then it becomes, we're not spending $1.2 million on the art net loss. It's an academic program. We, we lose money on other academic programs. Almost all, all our allied health programs are um, revenue losers, but they're important to do because they um, uh, uh, re, uh, have an important mission uh, that we need to um, fulfill. So if my comments is that I would like to see the academic involvement throughout here. I know when, and I was, had lots of questions with the Florida Orchestra thing, okay? And I think Dr. Steele, I saw you here, are you still here? We went down and um, to a meeting there that, that um, to get assurance that the orchestra was going to work with us on, on academic programs that our students will benefit and have opportunities they normally wouldn't have. Now I'm not sure how far we've carried that. Um, if it's just, you know, to me, attendance at events from our students is one thing, and that's very good to give those, uh, those opportunities. But, and I'm not asking for this answer today. I'm asking for, you know, this to be a overriding concern with our arts program that it everywhere our academic programs are matching up, just not in a haphazard way. And I've heard in a nice way, and I don't mean to minimize anyone's presentation, oh, our students are taking advantage of this, our students are taking advantage of this, but I don't think it's a real academic meshing here that has taken place yet. And I can see why. It's been too, too new, but I think that's where we, we need to go in this and make it a strong academic program or arts program, and not talk about it some, like, some auxiliary operation that we have over here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. We have achieved our goal then this, this morning because that was exactly the guidance that we used to drive ourselves. Let's, let's recognize the gift that's been given us in the robustness of, of the arts features that we have. Now, how can we optimize the value of those for our students, for our programs? We have a cost associated with that, and, and that's exactly what you saw. We have, we have opportunities. We have some costs. The good news is it's not worse next year than it is this year. We've, we've earned, we've, we've got those identified. We're moving forward. But our number one goal is to say, what, how does this fit under our umbrella for our, our students and our programs? And I, th I think we can very well respond, especially if we'll give those who are already focused on the financial side a little latitude to go ahead and execute their plan the way they've done it. They've all studied what they need to do. They have a going forward strategy. We've got to let them run with that 
as, their, as the finances take place, let us do the programmatic side of how to optimize the value side of it rather than focus only on the financial side. So that, that's the guidance we've got, and I think your comments today reinforce us to, to keep moving in that direction. I, I concur with, with what, what Dr. Law is saying, and I'm just going to say this. Uh, I'm, I'm an art supporter, and I think there is a certain value that we're never going to be able to attach a dollar n amount to. It's a very difficult thing to measure, but we have to have it. Uh, I, I think we have to have it as a culture and as a society and as a community. We have to have those things integrated. And I see in this presentation today your strategies moving forward to try to achieve what Mr. Burke's very good comments are, are pointed at, and that is making sure that the academic mission is integrated into it and continues to grow with that. And I think that's very important. I commend you. I really do. Other comments? Mr. Yes, Gibbons. very quickly. Um, I like both of your comments. I think they're, they're right on point. Um, I guess going forward in this economy, Dr. Law, we talked a little bit about this. Um, <clears throat> as we solicit gifts <clears throat> for the arts and any other thing, we, we should really take the time and, and the reason I say this is I just sat in with a group of CEOs that were talking about how people come in and ask them for donations and gifts, but they really don't know what they do. They don't know. They can't explain to them how it benefits the corporation to give to certain groups. So as we move forward, I'd like for us to be careful and to make sure that we have a plan going forward when we approach people about how they benefit as well. How does the total community benefit? Because there are some things, as Mr. Brett said, that you can't put a, you can't associate a cost to, but they're quality of life things that add to the local community, and they're also educational. So, um, d going forward, I like us to be very specific when we're talking to people about how they benefit from partnering with the college and their donations and other things with these arts programs and uh, and all the other things that we do. So, okay. great. Thank you very much. Dr. Cooper, thank you very much. Dr. Carney, thank you. Ms. Ryder, thank you. And again, board members, staff members from LEPA, thank you for your presence this morning. Mr. We, Chairman, before Paul Hanno, I thought maybe he was going to leave, um, the foundation, I think, should be part of this sales program as far as what the what we have to offer to the community. And, and uh, I'm just bringing that, I'm sure you have already registered, Paul, that, that uh, if, if this helps us to sell the foundation, then we need to understand fully on the foundation side what these assets are and, and how they're being used as far as the, uh, uh, as Ken said, the, the student program and how they integrate into the college. Right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we do have uh, uh, packets of information. I, I didn't want to have people paging through it while the presentation was being made, and we'll just leave those with Great. you. And, and you. it really is a compendium of the materials that, that support you. what you Thank saw you. today. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Bernstein. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Members of the board, Mr. Dr. Law. Thanks for allowing me to do this baccalaureate update. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce my team. And we have Dwan Fox. He is our um, program coordinator, and he actually helps with our feasibility studies. Once we are looking at new programs, he helps with the implementations, the budgets, the lab fees. We have uh, Lee Hoff. She's our operational person. She works with the central records, advising in the state with our student database and academic effectiveness on our assessments. And we have Tracy Garrett, who is our coordinator of marketing, and she does all our promotion materials, our, our outreach to students, our information sessions, billboards, TVs. I have a packet of information, and I'll show you that she, what she does on all those, um, on all of our programs. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to just start with a little bit. In, in 2001, and many of you, uh, Mr. Johnson was a, a a key player in all this, the legislature determined that St. Petersburg College would begin baccalaureate programs. We were the model for the state, and we began in these three areas, technology management, the BSN in nursing, and teacher education. These were three critical areas that were determined to be in need of employees. At the time, Florida had um, was 47th out of 50 states in the number of baccalaureate degrees that it awarded. 
and we were having a thousand people a day move into Florida and these areas had severe shortages and so in order to increase access and baccalaureate prepared individuals the um, state decided that we should try and be a model and to see how many um, how, how our programs would work in determining the um, production of baccalaureate degrees so we started with those three areas and we um, hired Dr. Tom Furlong, which was the best thing that we could have done because he worked at the state and he had a lot of, he could cross over between the state university systems and the community college. He was very focused and he knew all the players, so we were able to follow the state university. Yeah, a very strong history at Tallahassee <coughs> Community College is really the quality. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew Dr. Law, so what can we say? Everything was good. Um, we followed the state university system academic policies. We did the 120 hours, we did the foreign languages, we used the common prerequisites. Anytime that there was accreditation that we were, could go for for our special programs, we would do that. We have ABA for our paralegal. We, have, we were the first um, community college to receive um, CCNE, which is the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education in the, in the country. So that was a, a pretty good coup for our nursing program, which is already very outstanding. Uh, we had state program approval on our College of Education. We have dental hygiene and vet tech. All of them have a, achieved their accreditation in those areas. Um, we also realized that we had to do um, targeted marketing because, as you know, it was St. Petersburg Junior College for many years. And as we transitioned into this new step, we really wanted people to be aware of the baccalaureate opportunities. So we had information on billboards. We had buses. We had direct mailing pieces. We radioed, we televisioned, we tried to outreach to as many people as we could to let them know that St. Petersburg Junior College now had a lot of different opportunities for graduates and our community members. The finance piece was an important piece. In the legislation, it indicated that we were to be between the two-year tuition range and what the state university system charged. So we took the University of South Florida and we realized that their funding formula had a 15% research component. So we took that 15% research component and we set our tuition at that rate. So it was somewhere between the two year and somewhere between the state university system. And we knew that each year as the legislature awards, um, allows community colleges and universities to increase their tuition, we would go up 8% and they would go up 8%, but our base was a little bit smaller. And so we would still be a really good deal because we have, our tuition would go increase, but we'd still have a benefit. As you can see from the numbers here, our tuition is $101. And the University of South Florida, when they have their board meeting, I think at the end of this month, they are um, estimating another 15% increase. So that would be $176.10 that they're gonna charge for their credit hour. So as you can see, we're still a very good cost-effective benefit for students. This is really an interesting chart that the state provided us, and this shows what a two, um, the, the student and the state pays in terms of the different options that um, people have available to them. The first one you can see is if a student decided to take their first years at a community college and then completed those upper division years at a, at a state college. The second example is if the student would go to a uh, community college and then finish their upper division at a state university. The fourth one is if they continued to do the state university for their whole four years. And the fifth ex fourth example talks about a student taking two years at a community college and then transferring to an ICUP, which is <coughs> an independent university in Florida, which could be a St. Leo's or a Berry University. And then the fourth year, fourth, uh, the fifth example is if they continued all at an at um, independent, at ELOT. At, <laughs> an independent college. And so you can see what the state would put in for those and what a, what a student pays for tuition. Um, after we got those three major areas uh, implemented, we had a lot of people. We had, um, we had bankers. We had um, the public safety people, fire fire chiefs and police chief coming to us and asking us to begin bachelors in other areas. And so we developed this process to look at different areas in terms of, of, of the rationale or the feasibility. And part of the needs assessment, we would look at the job projections. We would look at the job projections regionally and what they would be nationally and statewide, of course, and nationally. 
And we wanted to also look at the salaries that those baccalaureate degree students would be earning because we really wanted to make sure that there was a difference between the associate level and the bachelor's level because they were going to be paying additional money for our education and we wanted to make sure that that was warranted. Um, we did job projections. How many jobs did they think there were going to be? Is this going to decline or is this a hot job in demand? Um, we did employer, stu students, employer and student surveys. That's part of what Dwan does in his job. He goes out and he, we, could, we um, develop these surveys and they're really nice marketing tools too because we look at all of our previous graduates and we send out a um, survey to them and tell them about the different opportunities and kind of get their feedback on the areas that they're looking at in terms of baccalaureate degrees. With the employers, we ask them whether or not they would, if they're looking at hiring anybody in the next few years, if they are, how many people would they be hiring, what types of skills would they be looking for. And so once we determine that there is actually a need for a program, we invite these people back, and I think we invited Mr. Burke to participate in our last public policy one. And these individuals participate in a DACUM session, which is developing a curriculum. And they give us the skills and abilities that they think are needed for that graduate of that particular major. So we're also we're, we're utilizing other programs of other universities and colleges that have developed these programs. But we're also trying to take the input that we're getting from our local community on some of the skills that they really see are essential in the workforce. Um, we look at the cost of the program, we look at locations, and we also scope out what the enrollment projections might be. After we did those feasibility studies, these are the programs that we currently have. We now have 24 different majors in all these areas. Um, as you can see, public policy um, right there under policy and legal studies, that's going to begin this fall at the Seminole campus. And this January, we just started our first BS in biology. And that's been very popular. And a lot of our students are wanting to do that for pre-professional degrees, either in veterinary medicine or um, pre-med. And as you can see on this chart, we also have some certificate options. And these certificate options, like in the uh, nursing area, um, we have students that already have their bachelor's degree. But sepsis, which is a, basically a, a pretty new disease that has come out, or, and we have three courses in our RN program that can be taken as elective. But if you already have your bachelor's degree, you can come back and get a certificate and take these three courses. We also have one in emergency and critical care. And similar to the public safety, we have a gangs enforcement. If you already have a bachelor's degree and you want to, um, this was a, a big initiative when we did some work with Guatemala. And the paralegals and the veterinary hospital management, they can, um, when they, once they get these, they, they, they get their certificate, they have a bachelor's degree, and then they can sit for their certification exam. We also have a lot of uh, endorsements and opportunities in um, the College of Education. And we have about 1,300 students right now in our College of Education, and 800 of them, a little bit over 800 of them, go the traditional way. They're our teacher education candidates. But we have about 500 students that take advantage of these other opportunities. And one of them I'm just going to mention is the Education Preparatory, Preparation Institute. These individuals will have a bachelor's degree. They might have a bachelor's degree in biology, and they want to come back and teach science. And so we have a certificate option, which is about 21 to 24 credits, depending on the area that you're going into. And we'll give you classroom management. We'll give you practicums and school-based experiences. And then you get your certificate, and then you can get certified by the state to teach. Um, this is a little bit of a snapshot of our full-time faculty. We have 48 baccalaureate faculty, and they're on 12-month contracts. The uh, majority of them have their um, PhD. Um, they do faculty advising as their load. They participate, like all other full-time faculties, in committees. They're on curriculum instruction committees. They participate with students in other clubs and activities. They're very teacher-focused, just like teaching-focused, just like all the other faculty members. But they do participate in a capstone experience. And the capstone is a little bit unique for our programs. We decided that this would be the culmination or the final assessment of our baccalaureate programs, where they apply all the knowledge that they've learned through all their coursework. And so each of them has sort of an end of program experience, whether it's an internship for the um, College of Education, 
or like with the nursing program, their um, major focus is leadership. It's really important to distinguish between the RN and the BSN, and they do that through leadership skills. And we had one of our students who was at Bayonet Point, and they want to go to Trauma Center too. So she created all the, the, the trauma scenarios that were necessary to get this increased level of certification. And so that was her practice. That was her project or her capstone. We've had students in our international business program who have done a business plan for um, like Condi Nash for the Dominican Republic. And he did such a great plan that the, the Ministry of Tourism has hired him for a multi-million dollar contract to work with them to um, market all their tourism opportunities. We've had students in our management and organizational leadership where um, she worked with an organ procurement organizations within the area and she helped them be consistent in their training and in their policies so she could reduce the time for transportation of organs in specific emergency situations. We've had dental hygiene students who worked with the public health um, department in Alabama and the um, Indian Reservation and worked on implementing and developing a fluoride treatment for Head Start children. So we've really had a really a lot of variety and really impactful projects. We've had some with just with our business where they've saved, they've done some reengineering processes and within their own businesses that they're working at, and they've ended up saving eighty thousand dollars. We had one student that did that, and they got a little promotion, and they had wow. a ceremony. It was great. Yeah. So um, we really are proud of the capstone. That's one thing that actually all the other colleges, a lot of the other colleges, state colleges, are now adopting as part of their. Um, programs too. This gives you a little bit of an overview of where we are in enrollment. Started out with our first year of about 621. We now have over 5,000. Wow. Too bad Tom's not here. I love that, you know. I think he knows. Uh, I think he does too. <laughs> um, and this, we had a big growth year last year, 24, <laughs> almost 25 percent over the previous year. We have over 1,300 students in College of Ed, over 15 in TechMan, and our BSN program has 800 students, over 800. This tells you a little bit about the growth in all the colleges, and that you can see it's not just one or two. All of them are having substantial growth, and, and we growth, and we continue to add different majors, like in the College of Health Sciences, that first started out with orthotics and prosthetics and dental hygiene, and now we have a health science management major that is also part of that. That um, white's the public safety, is that what that white is, or the real light color? Yeah, the public safety is near the top. Yeah. Right under the gray one. What's under the black? I can't. What's under the black, that is oh, the tech technology. management. Oh, right. Okay. And we've added, under the School of oh, yeah. um, College of Technology <laughs> and Management, we have international business. We have a business administration major and banking. Um, so we've also added majors within that particular. That's interesting. That I, I want to figure technology would have been the fastest growing. Is that is that our biggest school? But it is. But we have a lot of different majors in there. We have business administration in there. We have banking in there. International business, sustainability, management, and organizational leadership. Technology and management, in terms of its numbers, are, is not the biggest school. That one, technology and management, is not. But the whole college is. We have a degree in technology management, so. Thank you. Um, along with enrollment, it's very important to have graduation. So we have had 3,400 graduates, 1,200 new teachers, over 670 nurses and 750 graduates from the College of Technology and Management. Kay, is the demand for teachers still there? Because it seems like that has left the newspapers as far as the, and you're, you're hearing now that uh, actual en enrollments of students are projected to go down in the elementary levels for well, the next we are, years. We're still having um, placements, but students are not really getting placed necessarily in Pinellas County. They're having to go to Pasco, Hillsboro, and other counties. It's not before there were just a number of job openings right here in Pinellas. So I think there has been a slowdown, but then you've seen so many other students come back through 
other layoffs that they're they're now then doing some you know through our uh, our teacher institute you know they're coming back and getting a degree in teaching so Can we project the other counties to continue hiring is that what your projection is well we've been able to maintain a steady placement level right now this shows you we had 825 graduates last year and this is the representative partial as you can see college of technology and management had the largest but, well, College of Ed had the largest graduates in both of those programs that they have, and then Techmium. This gives you a snapshot over the last few years of the race and ethnicity of our graduates, the gender. And this was a snapshot of our graduate of our fall class. Um, 71% female, 67% of them are part-time, and, and part of that has to do with their age. They're 34 years old, they're working, and what is nice is that a majority of our programs, a lot of our programs have the modmester, the eight-week modmester. So if they find out that they're traveling or that they have a business commitment that's at one part of the year, they can take classes the first eight weeks of the semester and then not the other one so they're able to come kind of go in and out a little bit we find that with some of our management and organization students and our um, technology students the state um, gave us this chart in our accountability report and as you know there are 18 other colleges community colleges in Florida that are um, authorized to offer baccalaureate degrees not all of them are offering right now but the yellow line, the yellow block, is our student enrollment and then our graduates on the other chart. And then the gray block is all the other community college, state colleges combined. So at some point, I know they'll catch up to us, but um, <laughs> we're very, very large for one community college. And actually, we're the largest in the state. And when we talk about other colleges coming to look at us at our programs, we actually have other states that have come, as you know, and we've visited other states too to talk to their legislature and other members of their educational community. This also came from our accountability report and kind of reports on a retention and success rate. The state's able to um, track this a little bit better because they're able to um, access information on students that have transferred. Wow. And these are some of the challenges that we face. Um, was as, as with the whole college, we're facing the facility challenge. This went the public policy one that we're going to have at Seminole. Uh, Jim and I are talking now about where the rooms are. We're trying to find uh, adequate times and everything. So I mean, it's a real challenge when we're looking at implementing new face-to-face -face programs. We also have a faculty load because of our credentialing issues and because that we want to maintain a fair ratio in full-time and part-time and ratios to students a lot of our full-time faculty who do a superb job are taking on supplemental coursework and so we don't really want to overload them so we're very conscious of that um, there is a pressure on being the model for the state um, we have a lot of people that are coming to us and we want to make sure that we're doing things in the most quality considerate ways and and when we see and hear that other state colleges are doing things a different way, it makes us a little bit nervous. And we know that certain things could reflect on us. So it's really important that we all hold together and, and, and maintain one kind of a model in terms of the, what we're looking at for a, a community college baccalaureate. Because we really think that they have a, they're profoundly needed. And it's, they have access to so many more mm -hmm. students. And we just really want to. We feel that there's a, a lot of pressure on us to just make sure that everybody's doing a great job. Um, another thing is when you grow so fast, there's all sorts of issues. You know, we have a lot of students that are online. You want to make sure that they have access to financial aid information, that they can get, they can pay their bills, that they get student support services, that they, they have some tutoring. As, as one of my other statements here is student readiness. If you've been out of school for a little bit and you, you need some updating on your math or your communications we want to make sure that we're our students are successful so we're continually looking at ways to um, provide them more services and recently we worked with Martha Campbell's area and and came up with a, a little kind of a module that students can work with on communication so some of them that are going into technology and management where the 
employers were, are desiring more communication skills and they have not completed yet all of their general education, we really need to help them along as they're taking their other courses to make sure that they're kind of updating their, their communication skills. So we're working on that and math and, you know, with just so many students coming, I mean, you may have heard that sometimes, well, I, I applied and I haven't heard yet. Well, when you're a, um, a baccalaureate student, you have to have all your transcripts in from every other institution that you ever attended. And so once they're in, then we have to have this evaluation. Well, central records, they do a great job, but you know, they're now inundated with multiple sets of transfers, uh, transcripts from each student. So when we identified that the time lag was a little bit more than we wanted, we added additional people to that. And that's kind of what we try to do is we, we are all, we're all spotting out for those areas where we might need a little more attention or service or, or there's problems. I mean, not problems, but just different situations. Like one of our students wanted to get for a double bachelor. Well, we really had never figured out, you know, just get your first bachelor's. Why do you need another one, you know? But so then we, you know, did some research and we got our policies in place. But every day there's a new, you know, there's a new question or there's a new issue. So. Kay, I have a question for you because that probably fits under challenge more than anything else. Um, we're seeing more publicity in the newspaper about the for profits that really aren't doing the job. Mm -hmm. And. It seems to me that they do a lot of advertising, and we don't do a whole lot of advertising, but these students, in my mind, would obviously do a lot better at St. Petersburg College than they would be at some of these for-profits. And I think the for-profits, as I said, um, do a lot of advertising and make a lot of money. Mm -hmm because they've spent a lot of money on lobbying, so they must be making a lot of money. And it's because if they're advertising and we're not, the students then are having to make a choice that may not be in their best interest. There, there, there are a lot of places where the for-profits probably do a great job. Uh, but you're talking about placement, uh, quality, um, uh, the less cost to students. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if we're not marketing our program we as much as we need to, and maybe you're doing, maybe your growth, if you did a lot more marketing, maybe your growth would get so big you, you'd start to falter. <laughs> and maybe you're growing at the right uh, pace. But I, I just wanted to throw that challenge out there. Should we be doing more marketing and try to ramp it up because it could be more re revenue to the college, but can we, we be growing so fast we go bankrupt? You know, you can do that uh, because you'd only ask so much out of faculty and right. you have to find new faculty. But it, it just seems to me that the that the competition is not so good, and we're interested in education, educating students. And maybe we should be doing more advertising to tell the students we're here and what we can offer them. Uh, and, and I think they're making, because they don't know any better, poor choices. Well, we have been looking at our advertising and our marketing initiatives. And um, we do a lot with the four-year, and we do that in conjunction with institutional advancement. And recently, they did hire a, a, a new individual who has a marketing background and has developed a marketing plan. And so I think we're probably going to be addressing some of those issues. And we're really looking at more online, because a lot of our students are online. When we first started out, we probably had about 40% online. That's probably switched now to 55 or 60% online. So we've engaged with one co company that's trying to you know, they get into those cookies and, you know, they do all that technical stuff. But they really try to outreach and do some an, a, additional types of advertising on, online. And so we're, we know that we have to continue. I mean, you can't just wrap a bus or wrap a vehicle and put up a billboard that you have to continue. We do a lot of direct mail pieces to, like, nurses that have their RN license and, you know, trying to, to just outreach to a lot of people. We try to do the direct and personal, yet we try to do still the same branding types. So I think you're right on. I think there's a lot more competition out there. Florida seems to have opened their doors to a lot of different programs. You see that a lot in nursing programs now. I mean, some of our, our RN programs are having to fight for clinical space because of some of these colleges that are coming into Florida. Yet I think you're right. Some of the quality isn't there. And so we just have to 
you know, keep doing what we're doing. And though I don't know if we could do any more than 25% <laughs> well, <laughs> over the last year. So. Well, I, I, I don't mean that we should just, you know, open the door, but it seems to me that, that students, from what I can gather, and it, I may be totally wrong, are, are not meeting their expectations at these for yeah. profits and since that's one of our missions is to educate these students um, and the only thing I see differently that we're from what we're doing versus a Phoenix or whoever, whoever they are out there is is an advertising and it probably costs a lot less to come here I would assume because of the way we're structured it's a better program we look at placement and these students are uh, reading the paper they end up with a hundred thousand dollars in debt mm -hmm. and, and no job um, and you, you've talked about that and and whatever it is that these other institutions are doing to attract these students we should be we should be doing just to be sure the student knows what's happening and I'm thinking more about the students than I am about either us or the other mm -hmm. the not-for-profits because maybe we're not serving the students as best as we could. Okay. Mr. Burke, just real quickly, the, the best marketing I think we can do, Dick, we've, we've done recently, and that's the enhancement of our financial aid program because that's what the, the for-profits, their financial aid people are commissioned salespeople. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's, right. what, that's what it's that's about. That's how they do it. Well, then, should we be trying to do that? <laughs> but even, I, I was very, Mr. Bennett just left, yeah. but what we've done with the financial aid enhancement is the best marketing we yeah. can possibly do to get students in our school. Well, but whatever it is, I think that if that's what it takes, that's, can, then, that's what I think it does. Then um, <laughs> we should make the students aware. Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't want students to make bad decisions on where they're going to school and end up with dead ends. And right. it, it's, a, it's a real um, uh, black eye to all educational institutions. Right. It's true. So it, uh, uh, whatever they're doing to attract students um, to a situation I consider not to be the best, right. I'm partial to St. Petersburg College, have been for a number of years. But Maybe we should uh, ratchet up a little bit. Okay. Thank you. I and these are our future programs that you already have approved. So, and much, yeah. so that's any other okay. questions? Great. Thank you. I want to commend you and your team for just keeping up with this <laughs> incredibly fast growing. It's just amazing. And thanks it's for your support. We really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have a discussion for proposed board presentations. Uh, is there somebody who's going to... Uh, no, sorry, that's, a, that's just that, all us. Awesome, huh? let, me, let me say, I reviewed, you have a, I think there's an, a, an existing agenda for the next couple of months, right. and what I'd like to do is, uh, after some one-on-one -on -one dialogue, propose where we go from here. That's okay. A good plan. I, I I will say that these these presentations. Uh, trust me, we have been through these to make sure they're as focused as we can get them. They're just big big animals. I I, I want to see if we can't take your guidance for some more strategic, some more focused discussions as opposed to show and tell kinds of things. And if that's, the, you know, the master planning, the, the financial aid, the student services. So that's where I would like to take our, our uh, workshop presentation. I would like to see quickly before fall, uh, and Ken, I'm, I'm going to try to follow your lead from the, the, the minutes of the last board meeting. Um, we were forced by the state to add an 8% tuition increase. Um, and since uh, tuition is about half the cost of going to school books or the other half, that, that we would take a segment of that, um, and I think, Ken, you spoke to that, and not in those words, but in that, that same vein. Uh, we talked about a voucher for students on books or some means that we can help the students with their their textbook costs and use part of that eight percent however we do it uh, i think we need to put it in place because the fall will be here in just a couple months 
Um, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Um, we, we, I, th I think, as of the last board meeting, I th I th we have gone forward with a plan Voucher. to provide vouchers for students at twenty dollars to offset the cost of books, uh, Mr. Johnston, and the team is working diligently in partnership with FALA to execute that that plan and get it up and running right away. We're, we're really pretty close. We're within a, a very short period of of getting that going. Um, it's indeterminate what the cost is, but it is not nothing. It's a significant uh, commitment on the part of the board to our students. So we can share with you where we've been and where we're going, but I, I think we have taken the direction from the board to proceed along that trail. Is, definitely. If there's further guidance, we have that. Well, I definitely. We, I wasn't here last. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, there's, there's a, in, in the current budget, there's a one twenty dollar voucher per student for this next session. Is that right, Doug? Um, and of course, uh, when the article appeared in the Times about Clearwater High, uh, 